Hello, hello, and uh, welcome to a special episode of Salmon and the Boomer here. Um, we are embarking on our rather large and rather weighty um, democratization series here. I don't know, Trig. It's it's been a bit of a bit of a process getting this whole thing working, really. No, not in technically, but just in terms of narrative and research. And there's been a, a, an uncharacteristic amount of work going on. I would say we've um, done as much work on this one as we've done on all of the other ones put together at this point in time. If if not only in in, in all of the artwork, which once again you you put together rather impressively, uh, but man, and I, I have been reading more than I had done in a long time. Um, same here, really. Yeah, I I've, I've been trying to reread a lot of stuff I've read in the past. Uh, which has been a, not a challenge, but you know, there's a lot of stuff uh, to to kind of get your head around here. Um, there will be a little bit of preamble here, just just to get the normal stuff out of the way. Best way to donate was the Streamlabs. We just got a super chat in. Uh, thank you, Hangar the Viking, saying hail lobster. I will try and stop in the middle here, uh, in the middle of the stream, to to get the kind of super chats and the Streamlab. The Streamlabs is linked. Um, it's the pinned comments in the description. It's the best way to donate to us. You want us to get the biggest chunk of it, so YouTube isn't taking it. Um, and yeah, we're we're kind of just gonna have to get right into it, really, because this is gonna be a, probably a longer stream than usual. We have a lot to get through, but um, I don't know, Trig. If you just wanna, from your perspective, what is it? you're hoping to kind of get through and achieve with this with this whole project, with oh, this you, whole stream. You know what? I'm I'm. I'm really looking forward to the fact that for for once we've actually we're <clears throat> this is this has been well thought out, well researched, and and you know where the place where we are at the present moment in in time in history and politics has been heavily influenced by what we're about to discuss over the next well you say six weeks I say it's we we may end up doing this as, in as eight maybe even 10 parts, not just the six you think we're going to do, because this is going to overrun. We're not going to go, oh, it's an hour and a half. No, it's not even going to be two hours. I reckon we're going to be two and a half hours talking about this and feel like we've been rushed. I really do. Yes. And we're not going to cover everything we want to in every episode. This is, go this is going to be big, because this is not stuff that we are, that, that people are not taught this in schools. This is, no. this is... <laughs> What we are taking a look at is, is what, what has actually happened. And it, I'm, I, I'm not one to, to point fingers and lay blame, but we, we are going to do a little bit of that, I guess. Uh, we're certainly going to point in general directions and say, this is what you've been taught and this is, yeah, this is what that actually means and make your own mind up as to whether or not uh, Hegel was the wonder he's supposed to be. Um... <laughs> <laughs> there's gonna be yeah, there's gonna be theory here. We're not just gonna be covering the dry events. This isn't just gonna be like an alternate GCSC history module. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about the ideas that have underpinned what has been the process of democratization, and a lot of it really has nothing to do with democracy itself. Um, there are big economic changes, there are big cultural changes, and there are a lot of figures and themes we will see throughout this series. Um, but the the big thing I really want to impress on people is that we're trying to gonna we're gonna try and build this up piece by piece, and hopefully by the end of it you will at least you know understand our perspective on you know why it, it it's been a kind of a historical judgment by a lot of people, especially on the libertarian end of an analyzing history that democracy hasn't necessarily failed. It, it was never meant to achieve the things they said it was to begin with. I don't. I don't want to get too too into our judgment before you get to it. But that that's kind of where we're trying to get to and where we are right now. Uh, I'd, but, like, I, I, I'd, I'd like to say real real democracy has never been tried. Um. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Um, there's a few there's a few people I want to kind of acknowledge and thank um, yes. before I start this. I've had a lot of research uh, done by my good friend Duncan. You've probably seen them on my streams that I've done with uh, Rose. They've been very instrumental in some of the academic side of this. So thank you to them. Um, we're going to be using a lot of stuff from the Mises Institute, who are very generous with, you know, making a lot of the work of Mises, Rothbard, and a lot of these different thinkers public and easily accessible. There'll be more than a few Mises links in there. We're not associated with them. You know, there's no relationship there, but they are a very good resource for a more libertarian uh, reading of history. Yeah. Especially this era of history, I will say. There will be quite a few Rothbard links in here, and I would encourage you to seek out and read a lot of this material in full. Because unlike a lot of other academic writing, uh, it's actually put in very plain English, a lot of it. And it's, it's done in a, a much more 
engaging style than a lot of other academic writing that I've read. So that mm. is, you know, there will be possibly I'll link a bibliography in the description once I'm done with this. We'll have to see. There's, I said there's a lot of work into this, but it's we're going to have to start really with setting the scene, though. We're going to have to talk about yeah. where we are in 1900 as briefly as humanly possible because we have so much to get through here. Oh boy, I've just seen apparently uh, a, a a certain other boomer, a, a Mister Other Cat, as as linked as in Gab. Oh yeah, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how many we get here. <laughs> Crikey! But, um, thank yes. you, thank you, Sargon. Thank yeah, you. So so where are we now at the beginning of the 20th century? Where are we indeed? Well, um, a progressive era, I, I, I think, is, is, is one of those uh, terms that has been thrown around. Uh, kind of? Uh, ish? Ish, yes. But it's, I don't know, we've, we've kind of, uh, the American Civil War was only at this point. Oh, no, no. I think you're, you're skipping a little bit ahead there, Trey. Have I? Okay. <laughs> Well, it's it's we we're gonna have to talk about like what's happened in the U.S. in the nineteenth yeah. century. That's um, that's really a, yeah because there's there's a lot that's happened not just in the U.S. and but in Germany as well because Germany has just become a, a country, um and the U.S. has stopped being the wild west sort of. It's stopped being considered to be a complete frontier, and is becoming an industrial nation in and of itself, rather it than. You know, Billy the this Kid is, really is not the really anymore at this point in time. It's, no. It's no longer cowboys and um, <clears throat> Native Americans. I hate myself for saying that. It's cowboys <laughs> and Indians. Let's deal with it's it. Been, cowboys and been. Indians. <laughs> oh, we have a, an already another donation. Um, oh, yes, we do. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, we, we have a donation here from Sydney Hydra. Thank you for the $2 there. Um, yeah, we'll we'll bring Archon if we can at some point. I'm not sure about that. But like I said, we have a huge amount to cover here. So yeah, um, yeah. The like I said, the American Civil War only ended in 1865. So that was 35 years ago. That's like the you know the 80s to us. So you kind of have to keep that in mind when when you you're really here in 1900 at the beginning of of this period that the U.S. is still kind of in its post Civil War state in in, in mindset in many ways and. You know, you have to realize what, what a distance you are from the Industrial Revolution here. Um, the USA still has a frontier army. Um, they don't have a well-equipped yep. army. They, they, they still use muzzle loaders. Um, yes. And, yeah, they, they are still really out there patrolling a lot of this, you know, land that is still... They are still damping down the last of the Indian resistance. Native American resistance. Let's, let's, let's be more gentle. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. That's it. We there were still there were still tribes of of Native Americans roaming around. You still had very much the cowboy attitude across the whole of the Midwest. Um, cattle herding was a big thing, and and yeah, Samuel Colt was was making the was taming the West. Um, in the same way, in some respects, to as I said, Germany was just being pulled back together or all, all together. Yeah, Germany. From the, had, had, it, well, it was it was late, like thirty yeah. odd states. It was a, a, a bunch of despotic states sandwiched between the two superpowers of Europe, Austria and German and and France. <laughs> and you weren't. That's the only time you're ever going to hear me call France. Oh, you, you have Bavaria, you have Prussia, you have you know. Um, you know Hanover, and you have a lot of you know a lot of the nineteenth century German stuff is is in separate states. You're right; it's only just codified itself as a country. Yeah, um, we won't really be able to cover Germany at all in this first part, unfortunately. No, um, we'll have to pick it up really once we get to World War One. But that is that is the state of play in the U.S. Really, you are you have just come out of this frontier era. The last frontier has essentially just disappeared in the U.S. Whilst on the East Coast. They have been, you know, dabbling with, you know, large scale banking, investment banking. The railroads have, have only really just joined up the East and West coasts. It really is the time that America has codified itself as a full fledged modern industrialized nation. And it has only just happened now. Yeah. And it literally, literally only just, I mean, as you said, it's, it's like the, the, the 90s and 80s uh, is to us. I mean, that's, that's like, when South Park started their, you know, their run of cartoons. It really is a very short period of time. 
Um, certainly yes. within within people's living memories, uh, well, within people's living memories. In fact, people there, there were people that were fought in the in the Civil War that would then go on to fight in the First World War. They would have yes. been at the at the old edge of it, but they would have been the old war horses. Certainly, could have seen both actions. Um, <clears throat> there were people still alive, very much people still alive who fought in the American Civil War. Yes, yeah, um, very much people still alive. And we, you have the same kind of crossover era in Britain as well. Um, you you oh, have... Yeah. Queen Victoria isn't dead yet yeah. in 1900. She dies in 1902. She's in ill health. Really, the Victorian era is winding down and coming to an end. But Queen Victoria is still alive in 1900. Yes. Um, and really, the empire is at its height and starting to wane. Yes, you've got the Boer War going off. You've got a, a young, yes. Win young Winston Churchill running around... Uh, making comments about nothing so exhilarating in life as uh, being shot at with no effect because he was a madman and people would shoot at him and he, he basically gave him a bit of a woody. Um, <clears throat> but uh, ah, yes. there'll, be, there'll be more on Winston Churchill later. Um, but I'll be much more on Winston Churchill probably later. Probably yeah. not so much on Winston Churchill today, but he is he is just finding his feet in the world at this point. And it is worth pointing out that Winston Churchill was a warrior statesman, so to speak. Sort of. He was, Ish. yes. Um, Ish, a bit. <laughs> entering into this period, you have um a you know, I think the, the UK has a conservative government. And going forward it really is in a, a bit of a holding pattern. From the Victorian era, really. But yeah. it's starting to have to, like you said, you mentioned the bulwark, it's starting to have to grapple with some of the effects of an, of industrialization. And really, a lot of it is, as well, a lot of it's thinking, and we'll get into this, is to do with the empire. There is a real shadow of the empire over the UK because it has, it, it has cost them quite a lot, but it also has gained them quite a lot. And there's a lot of unsurety about that. Um, you're going to get that one up, Trig. It's, uh. it's, a, it's a case of... Um, the the beginnings of what what would really be considered modern globalism in many ways is in this era. Um, there's something I want to talk about. I'm hoping you know to really communicate the fact that a lot of what we'll see in Britain, especially as it grapples with the empire and its height and eventually its loss, is that the imperialistic instincts of people um, like Cecil Rhodes. We'll probably talk about him in a sec, but the imperial instincts of those people end up turning inwards. Um, a lot of the imperialistic and a lot of the control methods that were trialed in the empire start appearing in Britain itself, eventually. Um, you, you end up in a state where, you, you know, you have really the, the paternalistic ideas of the elite um, th throughout all this whole period, really, is that the empire is a huge weight on it. It's a huge weight on the minds of the English, you know, ruling class. Um, and as, as they start to realize that they can't hold on to it forever, that's really starting in this period. You know, by 1900, the cracks are beginning to show. There is already a lot about Irish home rule, as we'll, we won't be able to go into it in detail, but that does start cropping up during this period. And um, I think there's an, an article here we have. I've, I've never heard of them before, but it's a place called Electric Liberty, but they have a couple of paragraphs here which really sum up what Cecil Rhodes wanted and, you know, kind of his death kind of underscores the end of the great imperial expansion period of Britain. Yeah. Um, he's, if you ever get the chance, read some of the stuff in his last will and testament because he basically goes into the idea um, of, the, of the round table. He talks about the, the I think it's the Milliner Society and he, he goes into the fact that he thinks that not only should the British rule the world, but they should retake America. It's all this kind of like grand wankery. But Cecil Rose was incredibly influential. Yes. I don't know you, 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 you know you know quite a lot about Rhodes, I'm sure, as well from your education. I I know I know a little about Rhodes. Um, yes, and um, you know what? To to a degree, uh, he had managed to create in Rhodesia the breadbasket of Africa. Af it was it was ruled very very well and governed, but he was very much a globalist and. <laughs> He'd got this idea of, of, of the whole world under, under a British leadership almost, but that it would be a glorious United Kingdom of Earth almost at that point. Um, yes. And... How can I put it? 
big dreams uh probably would have led to the same sort of horrific mess we've got in at the present moment um but it is worth you know doffing a hat in some respects to to him and but at the same time nasty you know well nasty i'm making judgments secret societies with the purpose of of expanding influence across the world well it's something I'll, I'll we've spoken of that... before go on yeah so Cecil Rose was a white supremacist, globalist, fantasist bastard. He was. He was. <laughs> like, like, when they talk about the fact that Rose was, he was. But a lot of the people of that age were. Uh -huh. Guess what? People in the past were kind of shitty, especially people in power. Uh, and Cecil Rose is a great example of that. But his his globalist spirit, his spirit of internationalism, you know, stripped of the white nationalist aspect to it, but. Um, put in place just the will of the international elite. That is what stays intact throughout all of this, I think. You you can really see that the idea of mass internationalism ruled over by these, in their eyes, benign elites already exists by this stage. It is just couched in the old terms of empire. I wasn't I wasn't going to go to that state that you the the extent that you put it because to a, to a degree I I can, as you said, from my educate I can understand. Um, something of where they're coming from. This this idea of wandering around the world and everywhere we go, we go, we find heathens, heathens and bloody savages. They don't even need to know how to make tea properly. I mean, good God, the Americans tried to turn the water into tea in nineteen seven in seventeen seventy three. Well, I mean, oh, utter, yeah. utter utter heathenry everywhere, and and you know the, bringing civilization to the savages was a, a the duty of of any good man of the empire and it, that really was the attitude i don't i don't want to sort of go oh they're all bastards because the past they had a different attitude uh he well, thought he was doing what he what was probably for the greater good um he did but, but... he also he also <laughs> wanted to set up a massive secret society to conquer the globe he he is really kind of almost like he he's like a british george soros back then yeah. And he's also really, it's, I think it's important that if you have distaste for international interventionalism, mm. then, again, what I hope to show is that the, spirit, the, the, the idea of how you should interfere in people's lives in the Empire, good or bad, is the same instinct of how you should interfere in people's lives at home economically. Like, I, I would like to, as this go forward, this stream especially, draw parallels between um imperialism and economic invention in interventionalism because from you know a libertarian aspect economic interventionalism can be seen as essentially imperialism into people's homes and wallets yeah yeah and you know what the empire as well is is a lot the empire was not the source of wealth to the united kingdom that the people think it was. It really wasn't. It actually no. cost us a huge amount. Um, well, it, <laughs> it, it's the only yeah. It's the only thing that uh, in peacetime um, ended up uh, justifying or in there as justifying an income tax. Yeah, we'd had sporadic income taxes in the late 18th century and during the Napoleonic Wars, but they'd been begrudgingly put back in place. I think in the eight, in the mid eight, uh, 1800s to try and support the empire. Yeah. Um, at this stage, by the way, America doesn't have an income tax at all. Mm -hmm. um, they <laughs> they do a lot of and and Britain has minimal income taxing, and most of their taxation comes from tariffs. Yeah. Um, yes. Again, I'll probably talk about that a bit later. But, um, but a it, large part of the the income of the public purse is due to imports and exports. It is worth saying, yes. For for the longest time, it has only been the last hundred years or so that any country is really. Well, certainly England and America have needed an income tax of of the general populace to run the country. The countries yes. countries will run just fine without clobbering the pockets of of the general sort of populace every time they get a paycheck. Well, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get to the actual liberal reforms. But the numbers we're Disgusting talking about thieves. are very low. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, extraordinarily low. Um, it got it, it got a lot higher during the Second World War and afterwards, uh, but yeah, extraordinarily low back in those days. Um, these it, days they seem to it, think they the they the the government is due half of everything you earn almost. Which is yeah, it, it, we're talking at this thievery. stage. I think it's th it's like three percent income tax on incomes over like the equivalent of one hundred eighty thousand pounds a year. If you're a normal person in the UK in this period. You don't pay income tax. The yeah. government has nothing to say about what you earn. 
Yeah. Nor should uh, it need it's, to. It's... Nor should it need to. No. <clears throat> but again, and, and we reached this stage, we hit 1900, having gone through the biggest period of industrial, economic, and scientific growth that I think the world has ever seen. You know, if you think about the world in 1800 versus the world in 1900, it's a very different place. People have mentioned it there. Electricity's come about. We're starting to see the beginning of automobiles, the railways. Um, during this time, there's a lot of technological change. Well, you could, um, you, and you're only, you're, only, you're only holding your breath for a short while away from seeing aircraft flying uh, yes, in the yes, early are. 1900s. And as you say, 100 years prior to that, it was horse and carts. It was horse and carts and... and 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 you know cows and sh and horses pulling your plow through the fields it really was and we'd been at that particular point for hundreds of years thousands of years in fact yes we had right um, up to the romans we really hadn't progressed very much in 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 terms of technology and then suddenly you've got steam trains you've got cars you've got electricity and the world is 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 cartwheeling from this it is. It's, it, it also fills people with the sense of new ideas. You end up with a lot, some periods like this. In the 1900, you've just changed century, and there's a lot of kind of early futurism going on here as well. A lot of people are really mm. looking forward to what this next century and next decade is going to bring them. Oh, yeah. um, also, sorry, just a couple of super chats here. Thank you, guys. Uh, Neil Morgan, $10. Uh, thank you guys for doing these streams. I've learned a lot from you guys, and I can't thank you enough. Question... Uh, if Chauvin gets acquitted, will the boogaloo start? I don't think so, unfortunately. No. But, but we'll I, see. Sadly, I think the boog is becoming, or always was, a, merely a meme. I yeah. I hate to say it. And uh, Proper Horror Show, thank you. I know we've been discussing this a little bit in the background. You've been looking forward to this. Uh, seven, 777, a uh, lisp check. <laughs> thank you for that one. <laughs> um, there's, there's one thing I would like to say before we move on, because we have a lot to cover here, but... Um, the the Dickensian myth of Victorian Britain, the Ugh. idea that the poor universally lived in squalor and that conditions for them had decayed almost continuously throughout, you know, the latter half of the 19th century simply isn't true. We don't have time no. to get into it. We'll get into it later in terms of stuff. But wages have risen consistently throughout this period, massively, mm. uh, much more than they would do over the next century. The idea of uh, of the workhouses and uh, Oliver Twist and 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 mother getting up to drink her, her her gin as 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 you know for breakfast essentially was a very dystopian and almost I mean it's almost communist propaganda against England. Um, it is. It it really did give the Marxists in England a lot of material. Dickens, for his own you know, for, from his own perspective as an activist, he was he was trying to you know, increase the conditions of the poor, but he did it by putting out what is essentially propaganda, and it's fiction. Um, <laughs> the universe of Dickens and what people think about Britain during the 19th century is fictional. It wasn't actually like that. Uh, that's not how people lived, and people, you know, as we've seen in, as we see in places like India and China now, industrial revelations, uh, industrial revolutions are tumultuous. They yeah. are a big convulsion of change, and people get chewed up in that machinery. But so, it, it doesn't mean that those people wouldn't rather be working than dying. Sometimes that's, that's the big thing. Sometimes, sadly, quite literally, in some of the early machinery. Um, yes. Yeah. And and uh, hardship. And yes, the, you you were moving society from largely agrarian, largely people working out in villages and towns in the fields, and moving to cities and and becoming part of. The mills, etc., as you say. Um, yeah. But that, that, there was a reason why they did that. There was a huge amount of wealth being offered. And, and you know, lads were going, signing up and going and joining the army. Off they would go, fight Napoleon. You know, join the, get, get yourself a sharps rifle and off you go. Let's go and give Boney what for. And the world was, you know, by and large, actually... In com in comparison to what they had a hundred years before, really good, really good. Uh, communication yes. was fantastic. You got printing presses. You'd got newspapers. You'd got all manner of things that were that were frankly wonders in comparison. It is. It's. 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 It really is an age of wonders to many people around. Yeah. There. But again, it's the situation we get into is the nineteen hundred star. You talked about. Sorry, we've. We've not gone on a tangent here, but we've, had a set, we've, we've set the scene. We're in 1900, it's 1901, and Teddy Roosevelt has just been elected. 
and but kind of but, uh, i will i will talk to people um in terms of like what we're doing here we're going to try and bounce a bit between the us and, and the uk yeah we don't have time to there's a lot of stuff going to have to gloss over we're going to have to gloss over quite a lot of actual events to talk about the actual stuff we need to talk about in this context so apollo like we can't cover this entire period it'd take you know that's an entire co a series of streams in of itself but we we reach a point now where we have you know the original progressive we have the first progressive and the progressive era you know what, let's, um, which let's is, get... is which is, which teddy is uh, good old good old teddy roosevelt yes he's uh He's a man, he's a legend, um, and he's almost, I mentioned it off air, but he's almost like a Trumpian figure at the time. Yes, he's, he's, he's kind, very... of, kind of version 0. 0.5 Trump. He's, he's, he's not quite the final release of Trump, but he is, he's definitely loud, brash, a little bit rude, uh, a bit of a man's man, goes out, has a drink, goes out hunting, he's, but he, he, he wants to see you know the world go forwards. He was, yeah, he was... Perhaps the start of the rot, but at the same time, quite a lovable character. There's, it's, it's difficult to to dislike Teddy Roosevelt. Um, no, he he is a likable character. He's a he's good at being a myth. But we're, we're actually going to be glossing over some of his more positive aspects. I'm afraid, but he he was he did have a lot of positive aspects to him when it came to being the president. He was a good showman. He was a good salesman, and you know he was a larger than life character. But that self-aggrandizing and that kind of myth-making is really kind of a little bit of where he started to nibble at the edges of the Republic, let's say. There was, there was a lot of stuff there. Um, we'd just come out of the age of the cartels and the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and Standard Oil. And those had just risen and fallen very dramatically. The monopolies had taken hold and actually kind of failed on their own in many ways. Yep. It's kind of unfortunate for this period in history that you know those those people's powers have started to wane. Um, oh, that's that's oh. the yeah that's the Federal Reserve one. Yeah. Oh oh um, hold on. Oh well, that was <laughs> ah we want we want actually what's actually further down, don't we? It's uh let me just no it's not further down. It's the it's it's the uh there's a, a link there to to the actual one about Roosevelt. Um, that's a completely different section of the book. Okay, I'm being um, a boomer. Let me just remove that off the screen, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll get that. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. So we got a lot of we got a lot of um, kind of notes here uh, to get through. I, I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit a little bit mixed up. There's a lot of like I said, a lot of Rothbard here because his his reading of history I think is very informative for what we're trying to show. And like I said, I'd like to thank the uh, the Mises Institute people. I'll I'll put it in the general chat trick just so you can get that one up. But. Uh, it's yeah, it's progressive area. It's about Roosevelt, and there's a, there's a footnote here actually, um, in the text, which is I think quite telling about Roosevelt's characterization of himself, because there's a lot of stuff about him being a trust buster. But before I go into some of you know the the departments of government he created and a little bit about his kind of personal style, um, we can maybe start debunking the myth of Roosevelt a little bit, because a lot of people talk about how based he was. A lot of people have this again. Almost like the Dickensian myth of Victorian England, there's the larger-than-life myth of Teddy Roosevelt. He was an aristocrat, uh, he was someone who came from a very rich family, uh, and he was someone who saw himself as, you know, deserving of power in many ways. He's, he, you know, he really, he really was an egotist, um, but he, I don't think he was an ideologue. I, I don't know, Trey, from your reading of... Teddy Roosevelt. What what is your actual impression of Roosevelt before I kind of launch into this Rothbardian attack on the man? <laughs> I, I I think you nailed it really rather well in 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 an early version of Trump. He was very early Trumpian. He was as you said he was wealthy. He 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 did sort of believe that it was it, stand aside. It's my turn to have a go at this leadership thing now. Um, but at the same time, he was a drinker. He was he was. I would have gone well with it if it if I'd run into him at a party. I could have quite happily sat there and had a damn good chat and a smoke of a pipe and a few pints with the man, um, which is more than I could say for a lot of other people we may be talking about later, who I would have found to be horrible ideologues. This guy was someone that probably really wanted to do the right thing for his country, and and had a lot of information around him that that guided him in a certain way. Which is 
how he's ended up doing what he's done. The the trust busting aspect of things, there's a lot to be said for what happened with Standard Oil and Standard Oil. <sighs> Standard Oil tore apart what was many, many, many small cottage industries that was pumping oil out of many oil fields all across Texas and all across the, 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 the middle of America. But at the same time, they were creating a hell of a mess. There was streets with oil pouring down it. There was lakes filling up with basically petroleum byproducts. Uh, there was huge amounts of waste all over the place. And Standard Oil kind of came along and sort of went, right, you'll sell to me or you'll regret it. And never Everybody sold to him eventually, and what you ended up with it was a very efficient and very standardized and very, you know, very effective oil industry that the, has driven the United States for the last hundred years to being the most powerful country in the world. So I'm not, I'm not going to say that these trusts are great things, but there was something to be said for what was happening with the trust and with with Standard Oil and and busting it. Uh, may not have been the best thing uh, to do, although it did certainly look like it at the time because it was causing a lot of people pain. Those that didn't buy in, those that didn't go, okay, you know what, I'll sell up, I'll take a few shares. Those that did became extraordinarily wealthy, a lot of them, but those that didn't got crushed. And it looked like a very, very fat industrialist crushing huge numbers of average Americans trying to make a living. Yes, it did, and it was ugly. But yeah. it was not ugly in the same way we see kind of monopolies now. Um, no. It's further down in the text. I don't want to end up digging for it. But Rothbard in this makes a very good point that the, actually the cartels ended up being more inefficient than some of the smaller companies around them. And they naturally mm. rose and naturally fell yes. is, is what happened in this era. Because of the market economy, it was allowed to become self-correcting. And, you know, Standard Oil and a lot of the standard, the cartels had failed. In fact, the point that he makes is the only real kind of monopolies that succeed are because of government contracts on the railroad. Um, there's there's a, 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 a great point here that the where the most power is gained is the interface between government and private business. And we're going to go into the ideological underpinnings of it in a little bit, but Roosevelt saw himself and the government crucially as being the people who need to intervene he was an interventionalist and that is really the big difference here and again the progressive party was populist it it borrowed ideas from both the republicans and the democrats as you've probably seen on screen for a bit there on the link it talks about uh, you know trade tariffs and free trade being kind of the big difference between the two parties economically at the time yeah and um roosevelt took a bit from each he went to balance tariffs with you know taxation and trade and wall street and he really just took up the populist causes of the age he wanted to give the people what he what they wanted and he wanted to be loved but i, I don't think he was actively evil and i don't think he really abused his office in the same way some people later will. I think the biggest the biggest yeah. criticism of him, if we look down here, I think it's 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 like footnote number fifty four or something. There's a lot of editor's mm. notes here. But mm. it, it goes on to say that um Roosevelt's characterization as a trust buster has been greatly exaggerated. In the entire seven and a half years of his presidency, only forty four antitrust cases were initiated, with almost ten against um actually large companies. Although he initiated more uh Although he initiated more than his predecessor McKinley under the four-year presidency of, a, of his successor Taft, 80 suits were initiated. So Taft, actually, the, you know, the big fat guy, yeah. um, is, is a bigger trust buster by almost double than Roosevelt was. His m image in the modern age is a myth. In many ways, well, Taft was he kind is. of trying to do what Roosevelt did. He's, he'd seen he'd seen it as a trend, and it was he, Taft was trying to smash anything that looked even remotely like a, a monopoly. Yes, he'd seen it as a as a well. Also, the Republican Party during that period, um, we're not really going to cover Taft that much. No. Um, so we can talk, probably talk about it here. Is it, they were losing a lot of power in that area uh, at the, in 1909 when Roosevelt lose, uh, leaves office? You have the four year presidency of Taft and the Republicans are on a massive defensive to the Democrats. And they are looking to do anything that will win them votes. And trust busting is, was kind of the popular issue of the age. Um, but it, it, it picks out here, and the, the, uh, the biggest criticism, really, of the trust busting of, of Roosevelt was that he picked winners. And he aligned himself very, very closely with a, a figure we'll see 
throughout this, really, and the subsequent companies that he owns is Mr. Morgan, Mr. J.P. Morgan. Jean-Pierre Point um, Morgan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Boy, can I go on about him. Um, yeah, yeah. J.P. Morgan's an interesting character and, and, and well worthy of, of, of some serious investigation by itself. Uh, I personally don't particularly like him because, well, J.P. Morgan sided with Edison in the great Edison versus Tesla uh, technology wars. Uh, J.P. Morgan wanted to see a, a power station on the end of every single street and deliver that wonderful DC electricity uh, to every household, whereas uh, Nikola Tesla was there going, hold on a second, I can, we can build a power station you know, 20 miles out of town and we can drive it via my new AC electricity. And, and Edison and J.P. Morgan tried to crush him repeatedly for it, of course. Yes. Uh, it, it's it's another again. It's it's the king making aspect of it, and it, it, like, so the 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 editor's note at the end of this goes on to say that Roosevelt's bad trusts were basically non Morgan trusts, mm. such as Rockefeller controlled Standard Oil or the um, Harriman dominated Union Pacific Railroad. Conversely, Univ- uh, Roosevelt's good trusts usually turned out to be big Morgan controlled companies, such as the U.S. Steel. Uh, International Harvester Co- Corporation, etc. Because U.S. Steel persisted and became semi-governmental for a long time. Yeah. Uh, no action was taken against either of these giant concerns, um, partly because of Roosevelt's implicit trust in Morgan-backed firms and the quiet, although highly effective, pressure applied by such influential Morgan men as H. as George W. Perkins and um, El- I think it's Albert H. Gray, board chairman of U.S. Steel Corp. Um, yeah, they're, they're quoting Birch Elites in American History, page one six four to one six five. There, a um, little bit of a little bit of academic notes here for you, um, if, you if you're if you're trying to trying to keep up there. But that that is that is what the Rothbard has to say, and you know some of the guys at the Media Institute who who curate his work have to say about Roosevelt that he essentially picked winners. Yeah, and that is what the role of an interventionist government ends up being in this period. That even though I don't think I think Roosevelt would as was as good as you can get with human nature factored in. Um, he was a self-aggrandizing, self-interested, but he was a person, and he was a person who wanted to be loved. Yeah. Um, and I think he was almost kind of a best-case scenario for an interventionist, in that yes, he he was self-interested, but he wasn't actively ideological, and he wasn't actively evil. That is the best thing I can say about him from this perspective, really. Yeah, yeah, Roosevelt definitely not evil. Um, the picking of winning winners as well. Uh, it's not great. It's a bit like sort of imagining uh, uh, the current monopolies and mergers commission kicking the living daylights out of say uh, Linux and Unix platforms whilst uh, letting letting Google and Apple and Microsoft do their thing. Um, they kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly kind of what's going off. Yeah, exactly. Um, a bit of a disgrace. Uh, but it is what it is, and that is the way history always seems to pay out, is the ones that are... Uh, the, the winners that have been picked tend to win. I'm not yes. saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. Well, no, I am. I'm going to say it's bad outright, for certainly for free trade. Um, but it's what happened. Uh, and, and that's all there is to it, really. Um, it is. It's a damn shame, it's, to be honest. But... Uh, he, the thing is, he, he also inserted himself in a lot of issues at the time, which, again, Rothbard argues were overblown. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm kind of going a bit long on time here on certain things, so I'm going to try and move along a bit quickly. But the uh, Teddy Roosevelt, he created the Bureau of Chemistry, which later became the FDA, I yes. think that was for drug purity. There was a big drug purity panic. Um, and yeah. he was very, he was not keen and he didn't have faith in industry's ability to self regulate. Well, bear um, in mind, this was back in the days when drugs were largely unregulated completely. Yes. We were talking about a period of time, the Victorian era was often uh, labelled the, the Great Binge. Um, even as far as the, the First World War, you could pop into Boots, which is a big 
group of chemists in the UK. I don't know if it goes elsewhere, out, outside of the UK and maybe a bit into Europe. Boots the Chemist, big pharmacy all over all over England. You could wander in there and, and, and buy your little Tommy who's gone off to fight the war and go and, and, and give what ho to the Bosch. Uh, you could send him a package of, of, of a bit of heroin, a little bit of cocaine and, 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 a, and, a, and a side kicker of speed in a nice little package uh, all, all put together by Boots. Um... In- <laughs> Despite the reputation, yeah, like I said, um, something I want to impress on people is that during this period, there are a lot less people in the world, first of all. The world population is a lot, 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 lot lower. Um, yeah, yeah. I found out the other day that the year I was born, the world population was 4 billion. The population of the world okay. is currently 7.8 billion, and that's in my what, lifetime. Ha- how many people do you think were alive? Best guess. In uh, 1900. In 1900, best guess. Yeah. Working on the figures that I'm, uh, I, I've, I've, I've just sort of said, if it's doubling every 40 years, um, it would have been two billion, maybe, maybe one and a half billion people, maybe two billion people back then. Yeah, you are, you are dead on. 1.6 billion people. Yeah, yeah. Rising to, I think, about like 1.8 um, billion. When we get to the, but considering we were eight now, that's like if you if you take a room room with sixteen people in it, remove fourteen of those people. That's that's how populated the world was back then, in in comparison. Yes. That's how much more it, space every person had. It's ridiculous. Yes, it it is massively different to the world we see today, yeah. um, and and like I said. A, a, there was also a lot less laws. A lot more stuff was permissive, and a lot more, a lot less stuff. I want to impress some people was overseen by the state. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll go into this is pre-Federal Reserve. This is pre-FTC. You know, all of these things are new, and the idea of you know state interventionism to this degree is new. It is it is really just being trialed. Um, you know, Roosevelt also in, basically created the Department of Commerce and Labor, um, and he also created the the Bureau of Corporations, which is the precursor to the FTC. And he did all of this by inserting himself, you know, via the media in many ways. He was very media savvy into the big issues of the time and coming out and saying that, you know, I have the answer to this. You think this is a problem? I will fix it. And as a politician in the U.S., that was actually relatively new. There had been a a big effort, really, um, with the reading of the way the Founding Fathers wanted, intended the U- U.S. to be, that politicians shouldn't really do that, especially the president. Um, he didn't actually expand the power of the president a huge amount, but he did extend the scope of, of American bureaucracy to, to be more love. He basically said to people, you know, all these problems, the government has an answer to them. Yeah, yeah, which... This is somewhat of an antithesis to my to myself. I've always said, you know, whenever a government asks for power, no matter how 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 wonderful and great you may think the government is now, remember that that government might change in four years' time, and you may have some horrendous government that wants to uh, to abuse those powers, and you've just given them all the tools that they need. Um, never give tools to tyrants, as I would more sort of succinctly put no, no. it. And that is what has happened at this point. America being a great libertarian state, founded on libertarian ideals, has suddenly forgotten all of this and suddenly kind of adopted the state as a new god. Just to a little oh, degree. Not quite. Oh, oh, yeah, but largely, I think... Maybe a dad, kind of almost, dad, um, almost mom, mom and da- yeah, mum and dad state. All, all of a sudden, yes. we're, we're we're looking to the state to be our parents at the beginning of the nineteen hundreds. Well, I just wanted to get into really the state of things here. Um, yeah. Another point I think I forgot at the beginning was that I think in both the U.S. and the U.K. it was only really land owning men. Like if you, you had to own some kind of property and have you know at least some small stake. And and be a man in order to vote in this time. Same with the UK. Um, in fact, in the UK, this is one that everyone gets wrong with suffragettes. It was you had to be a landowner to get the vote. There yes. was there was nothing in the UK's laws that said you couldn't be a woman and own land. And if you would, you owned a vote. Women had the vote before the suffragettes in the UK 
do not let anybody tell you otherwise, what the suffragettes yes. did was actually empower a huge number of just working class men and women to have the vote. It really... They thought it was votes for women. It was votes for men as well. They did wonders. Again, it's, at this that is point. something that we're getting. Look, this is something that we'll cover probably during the the First World War because yeah. that really is kind of one of the punctuations of it. But uh, the the institutions of democracy really are, they're in their infancy. But the power to the people aspect of it already exists, even without really many ideological underpinnings here. I think that mm -hmm. Roosevelt largely just followed his instincts. Yeah. Uh, he was not an ideological progressive, at least in my reading of him, really. He was the first progressive, but he wasn't someone who was ideological about it. He was pragmatic, he was charismatic, but he was not somebody who was trying to make himself king. Um, but the, I don't know, things things start to go wrong a bit after here, but bef before before we get to some of the, the worst points of uh, of this era, really, in terms of... Mm. Uh, the institution building. We need to look at the ideological underpinning of where all this is coming from. <laughs> Are we oh, the the H word? Yes. Um. It, it's it's again. We're getting into political theory territory here. But a lot of the economic interventionism of this new age is prefaced on the ideas of Hegel and Hegelianism, and that word is thrown around a lot. Um. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it if you're not sure who Hegel is. Um, a, like I, a lot of people just don't read Hegel. They don't read Hegel for a reason because Hegel is somebody who he's a bit of a polymath in terms of philosophy and economics. He's someone who has a lot to say about a lot of things, but I don't think he actually has much of an overarching kind of worldview that he can sum up. There's a lot of axioms and there's a lot of dialectics that people use, which we'll probably get into. Yeah. But Hegel Hegel himself is not some he's not somebody that people actually apply directly. They usually filter him through something. And um the big thing we haven't talked about and kind of one of the big elements wood chipper one would of the be big good. elephants Sorry, what's that? Sorry. I said wood chipper would be a good filter. Um Yes, yes it would be. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't help the memes. Um, yeah, but you are correct. So the, the thing is, he is also, whilst people don't seem to read him, he's also held up as some sort of, sort of god, almost. And and the Hegelian dialectic, as you just touched on there, seems to be the only way of discussing things at the moment. It's, it is, it is a, a one tool fits all dialectic, dialectic tool, which it really isn't in my opinion, but I'm going to, I'm going to... Sidetrack is very, very seriously with regards to Hegel if we're not careful. Because I Oh no, no, it's I'm fine. I'm really it's... not the fan that everybody else in the world seems to be. And and you hear well, Hegelian dialectic thrown around all the time and who Hegel is. A he's a bit dry, and B, I think you're being kind with polymath. He, he, scattergun approach at things, yes. Polymath implies yeah, he, he was is. he was actually good at everything. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm not so sure he was. Um, and I think you're, you're about to touch on this. It's, it's also the beginnings of socialism as well. Kind of. The, the, the big thing with Hegel is he is the crescendo of what I would regard as enlightenment wankery. He, he is kind of the, he's, he's, he's the, the ejaculation of the mental masturbation <laughs> of, of the enlightened era. He is. He's considered this messianic figure in his time. Yeah. Um, and he is he's also considered as almost like the end point of history, as in Hegelian ideas in contemporary sense and thereafter in many ways um, are seen as kind of the be all and end all of thought. When really, I don't think he has a lot to say in many aspects. And certainly a lot of what he has to say has not aged particularly well. Like I said, that's why people filter uh, Hegel through Marx. Marx and and um, oh shit, what's it? Eng Engels, Engels. Uh, quote Hegel quite a lot. Hegel is really he is the mortar that they use to patch up the ideological and, and in a sense metaphysical failings of Marxism. Marxism doesn't have a lot to say without Hegelianism. That is yeah. that is the you know it, it, I'm using a lot of big words. Some people might get slightly confused, but Hegel really is he is a darling darling of, of 19th century kind of uh, one I guess uh, the start of one world socialism thought really yeah um he is really the the start point and the ideological underpinnings and his 
his almost messianic status is abused so heavily by people who just want to use it for their own self-interest that, you know, he really just becomes a, a toxic influence more and more in this time on the debate in public life because, like I said, he is heavily referenced by Marx and his his ideas, as well, as you probably can get up there. Again, there's a, there's a Wikipedia link here, um, but it's actually quite a good one. And I, I will make apologism for Wikipedia here because he... His th- this is really about his view of the state. Um, we can talk about the Hegelian dialectic. You know, a lot of stuff is misused, like you said. Um, I I I don't know. Do you want to get this up first, or do you want to launch into your rant about, about <laughs> some of Hegel's ideas being overused? Because well, that might be appropriate here. You know what? I'm I'm going to I am I'm going to run straight into the Hegelian dialectic because it's something they hear thrown around a hell of a lot. A hell of a lot. An awful lot of people, I don't even know if they even understand what they're talking about. Which is easily summed up in in the the three words that's always used is thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. The idea being is you have thesis, you have your idea, your concept of 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 your, your argument, you have your antithesis, which is any arguments against... And then through conversation and, and generally working things out, you come up with synthesis, which is basically mashing the two together and coming out where everyone's roughly happy with, with, with the mix of what you've got at the end. And the synthesis you have at the end is essentially the formation of your next thesis. It is, it is incrementalism, which is why the, the end of history um, thing starts to come about with regards to Hegelianism, because it, it is very, very much an incrementalist. It's, it's, uh, things become, the, prog- the progression of things becomes seen as the standard, the good, and what will be, will be, it, and it, it has happened because it was meant to happen, and it has happened, and therefore it is good. And therefore we are going to take what is good and what has happened and we are going to build on it with this next thing because we've seen a slight problem. And what you do not have in any of this, which is largely, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll refer it now to what we use quite often in business as, as, as a business improvements methodology. Uh, we use very, very similar things. We have a standard system. We look at it. We observe it. We'll measure it. We'll come up with an idea of how to improve it. We'll mash it into that thing, and then we'll have an incremental improvement. And what happens is what you've got ha- happening in the early, early 2000, uh, you know, 20 years ago with mobile phones. Motorola was leading the market doing exactly that, incrementally changing and building up phones beautifully, and then they didn't see disruptive technology coming around the corner because they're too busy looking in at themselves and, and, and discussing where next to slightly improve things, and Apple came along and ate their lunch. Google came along and literally bought them out, and suddenly you'd got Apple, you'd got um, Android, and you'd got Windows smartphones, and that was all the market you had. Other smartphones, other phones had gone they'd all been annihilated nokia motorola yeah, yeah. etc all dead and it, it is, is the, the issue is yeah it's, it's incrementalism it's in, because in of, it, of thinking, yeah but it's because of this I incrementalism it's, there is the internet and what we have got today and what has happened now is going to eat the lunch of the hegelian dialect dialectic it, this is what we've got now what has happened with over the last hundred years has been Hegelianism. It has been incrementalism, slowly but surely, and it's caused wars. It's caused horrible, horrifying genocides over and over again in Russia, all over the world, and Germany, you know, countless times, because they've somehow followed this terrible, terrible system and not seen the big change coming around the corner. Well, the... the- if you want to get the link up there, the, the Wikipedia one, his his view of the state is extremely influential too. He has he has an idea. His idea he put out a very influential book called Elements of the Philosophy of Right. Um, in it, yeah. he talks about this incrementalism, which you talk about here as well. His you know not only his theories, but on on um, kind of the way you construct thought, but his theories directly on the state were that. What happens is that there is a higher totality of world history, as he describes it. Mm. Um, the biggest problem with Hegel is that he is a determinist. He, yeah. he believes that there is a march of history, as we will get into at the end of this. He, he believes that 
what happens happens for a reason and always will happen and is incrementally moving upwards he believes in the you know the the refinement of systems of the state will always lead to more freedom which in itself is a nonsensical thought they don't have a direction they don't have a thought but he's a determinist yeah um if you look i think i think it's it should link to where it says state there there's a, a quote here about the state um, where, yeah, Hegel's state is the final culmination of the embodiment of freedom. Uh, the state subsumes family <laughs> and civil society and fulfills them all. All three are called ethical life. The state involves three moments, the Hegelian state. Uh, citizens know their place and choose their place. They both know their obligation and choose to fulfill them. An individual's duty is to be a member of the state. Uh, the individual has substantial freedom in the state, the state is objective spirit, so it is only being a member of... Yeah, it is only through being a member of the state that an individual uh, itself has objectivity, truth, and ethical life. Every yeah. member loves the state with genuine patriotism and has uh, transcended simple team spirit to reflect um, by reflectively endorsing their citizenship. You'd never so guess he, he was German, would you? Yeah, he, he, is, he is somebody who believes categorically that ethical freedom and human freedom can only be expressed through the state. Um, he also puts forward the idea in Elements of Philosophy of Right that, you know, really that the bureaucracy is a good thing and that you should, you know, he has a lot to say about ordering the world in an orderly manner. He has a lot to say about, um, you know, that people should be professional and all of that. But really, all he really comes out with when it comes to the state is that it is. It will always improve, and it will always lead to higher freedom as it improves. That is his entire, you know, thesis on government and on civil society, and on on the fact that he thinks that there, you know, it's couched in all these clever terms and it's couched in a lot of philosophical nonsense. But what he believes at its core is that the state is an instrument of absolute good that will always move towards a better version of itself automatically you know um, I, I almost wish he hegel was around to see the last century and the nightmares that the state has brought upon itself and and its neighbors because i wonder if it will change him because this whole idea of the the, the greater the state the greater the freedom is it is mind melting for me. I, I I nearly fell off my chair in in laughter and despair at that phrase. The the it it is it is crazy to think that the bigger the state, the more the freedom. Um, well, there's a there's another issue there in that Hegel himself really is a like I said, he's an excuse. He, like I I I describe him in my notes here as almost like the intellectual equivalent of Tupac. <laughs> in that what people would do is they'd find lectures, they'd find notes, they'd fawn over every little thing this man wrote. And you're right, it's scattershot. He's an intellectual shotgun. And mm. um, if, you, if you go to the... There's a link there, I think, from the Mises Institute. Um, we're not going to read the whole of it, but um, there's a lot of ideas that, that Hegel had that, like I said, lent legitimacy to Marxism. And yeah. the, one of the biggest problems with the Galenism is how heavily now it gets filtered through Marxism. Um, and it, it's, it's almost impossible to overstate how influential he was in his time and coming into this early 20th century. His ideas were worshipped. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, Fr Frederick Wilhelm III. Um, I, they, they all seem to think that this was... This was the future of, of, of great state thinking, was Hegelianism. Which, it, it, uh, and it's still there today. It's, we are still in a state of, of, of Hegelian politicians. Left if, uh, or right, regardless. As we move forward, I want to show that, you know, underpinning all of this is this idea, and I'll go into the real problem with it once we, once we kind of get past its influence on Marx here. Um, because the the real the real problem with Hegel is God. But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll get into its its influence on Marxism here. Then Hegel yeah, yeah. definitely There's is a, not I God. I love this first paragraph, and I'm probably just going to read it in its entirety if you don't mind. Go for it. Um, Have yeah, a Hegel's death in 1831 inevitably ushered in a new and very different era in the history of Hegelianism. Hegel was supposed to bring about the end of history, but now Hegel was dead, and history continued to march on. 
So if Hegel himself was not the final combination of history, then perhaps the Prussian state of Frederick William the Th- Wilhelm III was not the final state of history either. But if that was not another phase of history, then might the dialect of history be getting ready for yet another twist? Um, another Aftenberg, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, it's part of the idealistic thinking. It's, it's mm. referenced elsewhere. Um, so, so reason groups of radical youth who through, um, during the la- uh, last of the 1830s and 40s in Germany and elsewhere, formed a movement of young or left Hegelians, disillusioned with the state. The young Hegelians proclaimed the inevitable coming apocalyptic revolution to destroy and transcend the state, a revolution that would really bring about the end of history and f- uh, in a form of, n- of national or world communism. Yeah, it, it really, yeah, that was really one of the big kind of influences mm-hmm. after Hegel was a lot of these people who essentially became proto-communists. Yeah, and um, these guys were really shocked when Bismarck came along and... Bismarck, you know, Bismarck was really anti the unification of Germany, and he yes. he he was looking at it, going, you know what, this is going to happen whether I like it or not. I better step up and guide it and take some sort of semblance of control. Otherwise, otherwise, these absolute hideous Galian left wing nutcases are going to take and take take care of it and take us all to ruin. Now that's, that's where Bismarck sort of stepped in after being absolutely anti the. The, the 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 creation of a greater Germany because of these people these exact people he stepped in and 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 you know formed Germany in his own image sort of he, he did yes he he kind of had to but it's it's almost like it becomes like it's almost like a mind virus you get these ideas of you know the tra- the trajectory that history is supposed to take you get this idea of you know almost a, like i said a messianic drive within yourself and all mm. of this really is because if you want to go back to the other the other hegel screen um, where i list it lists some of the aspects of him it's because he is a protestant determinist he is a man who believes in theological planning he believes that the path of the universe is set by god and that is why he believes in the march of history he doesn't believe in it because of the state he doesn't believe in it because of any humanistic reasons in fact, Hegel himself says that all things exist because God holds them in his mind. And that really is kind of the entire foundational problem with a lot of the thinkers we'll come across here, that they couch the fact that they think history has a trajectory to it, that there is a beginning and an end and we are moving through that. They couch it through the authority of God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... Really, all Marx did, as you said earlier, um, to me, all Marx did was essentially scratch out God and write in proletariat state. And, well, um, even, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even as happened. late as the 1870s and 80s, there were still Christian mm-hmm. socialists who said that the you know that this idea really descended from God, um, and that you had to bring about this end of history this proletariat state, you know, that that history was not only inevitable, but you could, you know, you could learn the future from studying the past, is what Marxism says. That you can study, you know, class struggle, all things through class struggle. Um, he talks about class struggle and the proletariat in the way that Hegel talks about theological struggles and God. The two are one-to-one. And what you see here is that the thinking of Hegel, the thinking of Marx, and all the people who derive their thinking from what Hegel said, are indulging in religious deterministic thinking. They are, they are basically saying that history works because of God's plan. And it doesn't matter what you substitute there, that is still the line of thought they are taking. Even if you remove God from the equation, you are still subsuming to a higher power who controls the trajectory of history. And that, I think, to anyone who has any interest in objective reality is nonsense. Mm. Sorry, I'll stop my I'll stop my Hegel rant now. But no, I it, it it's worth it because we we hear people talk about Hegelian and and the Hegelians and Hegelian dialects and all of these wonderful wonderful things that Hegel came up with, and very rarely do actually does anybody actually ever go into any uh, explanation of of the man. And as you said, he was he was scattershot. He was all over the place, and. None of it was actually very well thought out. 
um, now. Or, or at least or at least in modern terms when you look at it back look back at it now it really doesn't feel very well thought out it feels rather um rather horrendous actually uh, like the... i said it's 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 the masturbatory ending really of of the enlightenment thinking yeah it, it, he is not someone like a lot of people are asking well what did hegel actually believe good question <laughs> I'm, i've struggled to pin it down he has a lot of different things to say about a lot of different kind of axioms like you said but he is not somebody who you can really derive a full worldview from. Um, he is not someone who you can quote in in absence of other thinkers. That's why he gets filtered through Marx so much. Yeah, because he's not someone who has a lot to say about the modern world that doesn't involve. Well, God did it. <laughs> I mean, he he came up with some interesting tools, as I said, as I said to you earlier. He came up with this this dialectic system. It's a good tool. But it shouldn't be the only tool in the in the toolbox. When you need a screwdriver, you use a screwdriver. Fine. But when you need a power drill or a hammer, you don't use a screwdriver. Sometimes no. you can throw out his dialectic and go back to Socratic method or Plato's dialectic or whoever. You you can use other tools just because they they have been you know improved upon or, or changed or someone's come up with a new tool doesn't mean the old tools are there to be thrown away. We have had democracy now in various formats for two thousand years, and it's always roughly failed or come a cropper at some point um but the tools that have been applied all the way through this that you know th there's no reason why we can't keep using different tools we can't change tools okay. and improve i think on that's them. enough i think that's okay. enough political theory for now we're gonna have to don't worry <laughs> guys we're getting back into the meat of the events but okay. we we needed that is necessary to talk about hegel because his ideas underpin a lot of what we'll see coming and i think you'll start to understand some of the the real logical, you know, kind of implications of applying his his worldview to the real world, because, like I said, it is religious, magical thinking, and they just try and keep that in your mind as we go forward. That he is the basis of a lot of what these people think, and his thinking is religious thinking. Yeah, oh. I, I think what we need to talk about now is some of the events in the UK because we've been neglecting the UK a little bit here. We, we've We've talked about Roosevelt. We, we've talked about some of the the underpinnings of what is becoming interventionism. But there's an era in history, and I'm sure you you experienced it too when you studied history, that is almost again worshipped in 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 like Britain as 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 we become a modern nation. Um, in traditional historiography, the liberal reforms are seen as one of the most good things a politician has ever done one of the most altruistic things a politi you know politicians have ever done it's seen as you know the, the 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 marxist view of history in this really the march of history view of it is that this was washing away the dickensian rubble and the you know the human sacrifice essentially of the victorian era and mm. ushering in you know the first sparks of this great more socialistic era that is what I was taught. The, the new classical liberalism. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's... Which isn't classical liberalism at all. But, yeah. And then we had the people's budget on top of that and so on. Do you want, do you want the people's budget Wikipedia? Oh, no, no, no. Well, we we, we need a... to go through, really, because we've just gone over Hegel. Yeah. I don't know. Do you, do you want to read this one, Trig? I can read what, this what... one. Uh, yeah. So, new liberals uh, saw individual liberty as something achievable... And uh, or only under favourable social and economic circumstances. In their view, the poverty, squalor and ignorance which many people lived made it impossible for freedom and individuality to flourish. New liberals believed that these conditions could be ameliorated only through the collective action and coordinated by a strong, welfare-oriented and interventionist state. And yes, we see the beginnings of, of the British state at this particular point. Which well, would, the, the modern British state, The modern yes. British state, yes. Which would, you know, yeah, within a hundred years be a bit of a, a mess, to say the I, least. I, but. Who, whose ideas do these sound like, Trig? <laughs> well, they, they do have a, uh, a faint whiff of, of, of Marx in them. It's not surprising, because Marx was lurking around in London around these particular times and talking to people, and Engels was, was there with them, and... There, there is, there is definitely a, 
it's 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 almost it's a very gentle Mm, very gentle move towards a more socialist government uh, under the under the guise of liberalism. It's certainly not Whiggist uh, liberalism. It's it's a much more uh, daddy state can take care of you. Don't worry. Um, which is you know it is it is massively stated. It is massively heading towards socialism. Well, um, it is, and it's really it's a break I think from the liberal tradition. Yes, it is. Um, there's a lot of stuff we'll probably talk about theory-wise that, that, that underpins kind of the liberal tradition and some of the breaks from it we've seen previously, but this is not classical liberalism. A lot of oh, historiography, from... which I vehemently disagree with, classifies this era still as a classical liberal era. It is not. This is very, very different from the laissez-faire, non-interventionalist, and freedom-minded work of those who studied and, you know, talked about liberty. He's, you know, this is, uh, it, it's at the very least, I wanted to put it here because it really just shows how Hegelian they were. And yeah. that, you know, Hegelianism is not something that is really part of the liberal canon. It is not, you know, his ideas on the state especially, and, and you know, the, the person's role within it, are not something I think that is compatible with old liberalism. Uh, no, not at all. Certainly not at all. I mean, in comparison to writings like On Liberty, etc., what was going off in England was anathema to what would have been happening in the States a uh, hundred years beforehand. Um, this was not a, a, a freedom to pursue, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This was the, uh, you know, hand over your power to the state and the state will take care of you. Uh, it's it's the first inklings of you know the idea that the state has a duty of care, but yeah. in saying that, in saying that the state has a duty of care, they infantilize the citizen in many ways. Yeah, yeah, we would soon see the end to a num we, We'd start seeing firearms laws and so on. We would start seeing the government taking the power away from the individual and taking it on board. For the state to take care of everything, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't you worry about it. You just call the police or whoever, and and they will come and and deal with whatever your problem is. And and don't worry, you're go you're not going to have to worry about looking after you for yourself because you're just going to give us just a little bit of your money every month, and and we're going to work out how to spend that the most effective way to to benefit you. Yes. <laughs> it, it does. It it does. It it really. And again, it's the same justification um, that Roosevelt uses for mm -hmm. create for expanding the power of government, expanding departments. In that, I am doing what the people want. I am a vessel of the people, and it's one of the first instances, pretty pretty transparently, how democracy is used to excuse and justify what is very very patently, you know. I, I I think the the lords at the time um, and the dukes. I, I don't want to. I don't want you know be, become someone who's bigging up the English dukes because they were autocrats. They really were, but they mm -hmm. they correctly identified this as the thin end of a socialist wedge. To quote them, and time has proved them right on, on that aspect. I don't want to go into my, my property rights are, are, are the best way of forming government, but there is something very, very good to be said about people that, that own property and the dukes and the lords, etc. are a very, very good example of that. So is the royal family. When they own a property, they are ten, much more likely to look after it better. And there's there's all sorts of things that we're going to get into other, in, in other uh, episodes. We're not going to talk about the... Uh, was it the tragedy of the commons and, and, and until maybe maybe a couple of weeks time but that's a really really good example of, of of where this comes in socialism is a is is an anathema to this you have a good you have good well meaning people that own land and have people working on those land within a a a, a structure it's like having a good bus a good well run business things are run slickly and properly and usually fairly efficiently then you get the government involved in it. It's 
a bunch of fat pigs rolling around in so much money they don't know what to do with it and they really don't care about efficiency because they can always get more money by sticking another penny on the pound in tax. Because yes. how's any, no one will notice another penny on the pound after all. It's, what's a penny in a pound? <laughs> Which is why suddenly you're paying four times more for petrol in the UK than you are in the States. Well, there's the, oh sorry, we, we've got a super chat a little bit ago, which I want to I can't quickly read because it's something I actually forgot actually. to mention. Yeah. So um, so it, it was actually a donation through Streamlabs. Uh, HK ninety four ten oh, said I vaguely oh, recall the reason. Yeah, thank you, you long time supporter. The reason uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted the FDA was after reading a book describing the conditions of canneries and being disgusted by the things that get canned in goods like rats and sawdust. Um, that, yeah, there's there's actually a bit in Rothbard here that I've skipped over about the myth of the it was the meatpacking industry specifically, yeah. and it was a myth. It was about a it was about a it was from a book called The Jungle, um, which was a work of essentially fiction. It was a muckraking novel by Upton Sinclair that that caused him to you know cause this outrage about the canneries when really the canneries themselves weren't in the state that they were purported to be. That was actually a lie in a work of fiction so yeah that that's uh, another another example of how a a panic a, a a kind of like cleanliness panic of the time like with drugs caused someone to take action from essentially what was a a fear that came about from a popular novel um it's it, it, again it, it's one of the first i think it, it's like works of fiction um influencing policy it's it's almost like a dungeons and dragons style panic but with the meatpacking industry and it's policy based on kind of popular moral outrage, which is, again, interesting. We'll probably see more of that going forward. But yeah, I just wanted to read that. Sorry. Um, I, I, I don't know, Trig. I, I, do you want to get into the, some of the meat of the liberal reforms now? We can um, do. Because we are, we are getting a little bit long here. Good Lord, I just realized it's, it's been an hour and a quarter it's been, already. I, I told you it was going to be more than two hours. Man. Um, Jesus, it's going to be a long stream. We could, um, we could, we could easily be going at this for, for, for a lot longer than that if, well, if there's, I... That's there's awesome. a there's a big phrase which is on the next slide over, which is the redistribution of wealth. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. the real break, I think, with the liberal reforms and the new liberalism was the idea that the government should redistribute wealth. That that yeah. is a huge thing, and they were possibly I think they were the first like industrialized nation to attempt any kind of project like that. And that is that is pure pure socialism. I don't care what you that is pure socialism. Redistribution of wealth is a socialist project. And we will see how they express that. Like you said, the the biggest thing in in, in all of this, as you mentioned earlier, is the is the is the, uh, the people's budget. Yeah. Which you're gonna bring up now. There we go. The People's Budget 1909 to 1910 uh, was a proposal by the Liberal government uh, that introduced unprecedented taxes on the lands and incomes of Britain's wealthy to fund new social welfare programs. It passed the House like said, of Commons in 1909, but was blocked by the House of Lords for a year and became law in April 1910. Yeah, as you were saying. Sorry. And I'm just saying, I, I, like I said, we're using Wikipedia here, but that's because I want to use sources people aren't really going to argue that heavily with. Because sure. if anything, Wikipedia has a left, has a bent to the left. I'm trying to establish fact here. So I know a lot of people get uppity when people use Wikipedia, but honestly, I've been over these articles and they're actually pretty good. Yeah, um, no, this is this is relatively accurate. And um, yeah, as you said, it's you're actually way better off using the sources, as you, as you say, from the left uh, when talking about them and proving why they're bad, because they're not going to... They're, they're going to paint the rosiest possible opinion of what happened. It's not like we've got a... We've, we've we've already got enough Mises Institute and Rothbardian stuff in here who would put a uh, a more heavy right wing spin on this and 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 so on and yeah there's no no problem with using Wikipedia for this um but uh, we're going to start talking about David Lloyd George and his uh, his young ally chap who we've mentioned earlier and we will mention again later in other streams uh, Winston Churchill Winston yes. Churchill. The, yeah, the the people's budget was really a Lloyd George and Churchill project. Yeah, um, it is the it is the culmination. The liberal reforms, you know, there was stuff like free school meals, the you know the old age pension act. They started basically what was national insurance and became labor exchanges, which eventually became like job centers. 
and unemployment benefits. Um, that That is what this was paying for. It was paying for a vast social program. Again, we don't have time to go through all of it, and that is very well-established history. But the big kind of back end of that was the people's budget. It was the kind of the use of what was begrudging income tax to both <laughs> to um, fund social programs. That is the first time that has been explicitly done in a, in a industrialized country. When, when, you know, we're not at the era that that starts happening really in the US yet. Uh, they're ahead of the curve here really when it comes to, I guess, socializing a country and adding what would eventually become the welfare state. Um, the the people's budget was paid for, as you, as you can see here, by taxes that were, you know, 3.5% uh, on incomes uh, less than £2,000, which is roughly equivalent to 225000 on today's money. Yeah. Um, and a higher rate of one shilling or 5% on incomes greater than 225000 So these are really, like, if you look at it, these are minute amounts. By I, modern standards. I would be very happy to go back to these sorts of rates. I'm just, just, just saying. Yeah, same here. Good boy. <laughs> oh, oh dear. These days you're talking 40% on anything over, what is it? Um, it's about 40, 50,000 pounds? Yes. Um, it's horrendous. Yeah. Most controversially, though, as they say here, was the um, introduction of a complete land valuation and a 20% tax on the increases on value of land when it changed hands. Um, it was, you know, it was based on an American idea, which kind of to get to get round income taxes. But the combination of income tax and land tax was something that the, you know, the higher earners, the industrialists and the people that felt like they had built this new Britain. It felt like that was an attack on their power base, an attack on on really their incomes and their their prop the sovereignty of their property. Yep. The argument was that the government has no business taxing what you already own. It doesn't. Which is yeah, it it which is a compelling argument, honestly. <laughs> um, it, it's again, it's not something uh, that there was constitutional issues, and this resulted in really it became look at what they called it. It's called the people's budget. Yeah. Clearly an appeal to socialism. And again, what we find here really is the first instance, I think, in British history of the Gibbs, of people voting to in, you know, enrich themselves in a way that they are presented as the state will give this to you if you vote for us. Yeah. It is essentially the first appeal to welfare in British political history. And they call it the people's budget. And, and underneath it is a very troubling shift. It's the start of a shift towards the state declaring that they have business in everybody's property. Yeah. And not just, not just everyone's property, everyone's transactions. Mm. This yes. is, this, you can't... You, I, I own a thing. I have earned my money. I have paid my taxes on earning that money. I have bought a thing with that money. Oh, I'm getting taxed again. Oh, I've got got this thing now, and and I've you know I'm I'm tired of having this thing, so I'm going to sell it on to somebody else, and taxes again. This is tra mm. transaction tax on the it general is, public. It... This isn't. I mean, before then, there you know the governments were raising money through, you know, tariffs on entry to the country. This is yeah. this is wild that suddenly the government is is literally watching you sell, you know, anything and everything and and sticking its hand in in your pocket every single bleeding time you you want to sell something. This is well, outrageous. Again, we're, we're coming at this from a modern perspective as well, but we know where this is going is the thing. At the time, again, all of this seems reasonable at the time. <laughs> and you, you can really say that to the people who have, you know, who have been through the Industrial Revolution and, you know, the very real problem that there, there is an inequality problem here, but it's, it's structural and it's due to the rapid growth of the country. Uh, but there is also a problem here that, like I said, at this point, people especially people who were, you know, property owners. If, if you, you've been able to enrich yourself in any way during the Industrial Revolution, if you are not on the absolute dirt bottom rung of society, you have a lot more rights than we have today. You have a lot more liberty than we have today. Society is actually a lot more permissive in many ways than it was today. Certainly when it comes to bodily autonomy, 
um you know it was it was very much like you said you could put anything in your body that you like there's, there's there's no like controlled substances in this age yeah it's it's people don't realize from a modern perspective they know what they have now and they they can see what was lacking then compared to what they have now but they don't see really just the 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 absolute like plethora of very strong rights people had in this era that people do not have now and you begin to see kind of the trading of rights for what becomes democracy you begin to see the trading of rights uh, and then covering those tradings of rights with a a, a veneer of mass appeal see, you and it becomes very insidious you say it seems reasonable at the time i i really don't think it did i mean a the lord saw this coming a mile off but it wasn't just the lords uh, the newspapers were actually kind of based back in these days, and you you found this great little sort of political cartoon. This, this is a contemporary cartoon for the people's budget. Yes, sums it up beautifully. The Stepping Stones cartoon, which is fantastic. Here you've got John Bull being dragged across an icy river of stepping stones, saying socialism, and Lloyd George saying, "I wonder how far across I can get this silly beast." before he understands where it's going. And yeah, this is the end of libertarianism and the, the, the freedom of the individual, and Lloyd George slowly dragging him across this, uh, this icy river through the stepping stones of socialism. So they, they knew what was going off even back then. They could see it coming. Well, um, the, the, way, the way this is justified, and the way that the liberal forms are, reforms are always justified, if you question them in a history class, is that this was the British establishment preventing a communist revolution. And that what they had... That is the argument that they, they made cont contemporary to yes. this as well. They made that argument as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the... Even in the most generous reading of history of the liberal reforms of, of this era of the state really empowering itself. You know, we'll, we'll get to some of the stuff about the lords and the empowering of, of, of the MPs later in Parliament. Um, through basically uh, s stripping the second chamber of its veto, we'll, we'll talk about the Parliament Act. Um, but the the big thing here, even the most generous reading of history, is contingent on two things. There are two pieces of logic here that fall down. One, that a socialist Britain was inevitable. That there is again, it's a, it's March of history thinking. When you look at the historiography of this, it is that a socialist Britain was inevitable, and that it, that without these reforms, a Marxist uprising was inevitable. Those, those are the two things that the classic view of the liberal reforms is predicated on. It's predicated also on the fact that state interventionalism in the economy and state expansion is a good thing and always will be a good thing. It is never questioned in, in the classical reading of history what is going on here. It's never questioned whether there would or not have been a Marxist uprising. It's never questioned even whether, the, you know, the softer form of socialism, being generous, we, we, you find yourself in by the end of, of this whole era, was inevitable in the first place. It's, it, again, it is very much a deterministic view of history they are putting forward here, that this is going to happen, and again, even when you need to be in charge of this, it is, a, the, even their most kind of gentle appeal is contingent on the fact that they are saying we're going to institute some level of socialism and we're doing it this way because it keeps us in charge. And that is the key point here, that their appeal was appeal to elitism and it was saying that we can do socialism and we will be on top at the end of this process. And it yeah. doesn't matter what's happening, we just want to be on top of it. It's, as we said, it's it's Hegelian incrementalism once again. It is. It's... And it, it, yeah. Slowly, slowly. Oh my God! What's what's happened over in Russia? They've ignored it, and the tidal wave of socialism has hit them. Well, well that comes a lot later. Yes. It, yeah, but, but it, it's it's coming. The, the 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 it's it's the beginning of it. You you're all right. We we're not quite there at this point, but they knew it was going to happen, or they thought it was going to happen, and they decided to have, make <laughs> well, it happen. Made it happen, the, as, and they made it happen gonna... as a result. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now other it, things are inevitable. Well, it, like I said, it, 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 it is very much a... You begin to see the creeping of this march of history thinking. That they are... And also the idea that intervening is their right. And, you know, is the best thing to do. 
I mean, to be generous to them at this point, we don't know the logical outcomes of Marxism and socialism. We don't know what putting this into practice does. They didn't know that yet. They didn't know what a welfare state would look like. They didn't know what a socialistic state would look like. They didn't know where this was going. But at a certain point, you start knowing. You, you do start knowing. You, know, you, you do start getting into this realm of this isn't working. Mm. And again, to, to, not to skip ahead too far, but this is predicated on the idea that one, this is inevitable, and two, this is good. Uh, yes. And we increasingly see that those things start budding up against reality as, as we get further into it. A um, couple of things I, I want to mention in between this uh, before we kind of dive into the Parliament Act here and talk about kind of the power politics of the Liberal Reforms. Trade Union Act of, 19, uh, of 1913, it made the unions opt out rather than opt in and reversed a 1909 legal decision. Yep. That was quite, you know, strongly upheld by the courts. But it, um, basically, it, it heavily empowered the unions and closed shops and the Trade Disputes Act of 1906. Uh, unions cannot be sued for damages. Uh, again, um, during this period as well, it's a little bit of a footnote here, but the Liberal Party did greatly, greatly empower the uh, the trade union movement. Um, but yeah. another thing I just want to mention, this is kind of the, this isn't the Lloyd George era yet. He's very influential, but what we're seeing here is... Uh, a lot of this at the earlier point, I think, is Asquith, if I remember correctly. Um, oh, he God, was maybe. prime minister. Yes. yes, I think you're right. He was prime minister from 1908 to 1906. And uh, preceding him, uh, oh, who was it? Because there, there, there was someone who was only in power, I think, um, from, from 1906 to 1908. Uh, I've... I've I'm, God, I'm having a brain fart here. My, my oh, apologies. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, th sorry. A lot of this takes place, uh, the liberal reforms take place under Asquith, but um, previous to him, there Gascoigne? was somebody else who's, who's Is it Gascoigne? Uh, sorry, uh, Campbell Bannerman. Campbell Bannerman. Bannerman, who's, yes. Yeah, who's, who's only in power, really, from 1905 to 1908 and doesn't see most of these liberal reforms come in. I always forget Campbell Bannerman because he's kind of doesn't really do anything. He's kind of boring. Um, but I, I will just mention, you know, we yeah, are mentioning Lloyd George and Winston Churchill here, but it is worth pointing out that you know prior to nineteen uh, sixteen, it is Asquith who is in charge of the Liberal Party, and it is the radicals under him, the people who were considered radicals at the time. I'm, mm. I'm not using that word lightly. Um, Lloyd George and Churchill, who were the ones who were pushing for these, you know, the hard edge of these liberal reforms. Yes. Radicals in, in the Liberal liberal Party, as they were known, who would then, of, you know, as in, in the case of uh, Churchill, jump over into the Conservative Party, and suddenly the Conservative Party was full of these liberal um, radicals. Well, I, would, I would really describe them as establishmentarians. Uh, they are the establishment, they know their establishment, <laughs> and as we'll probably go on to in a second, yes. they empower themselves through this constitutional crisis. Um, and through the Parliament Act of 1911. We jump over um, to that. Which, which is really just, it's a constitutional bust up between Parliament and the House of Lords over the, you know, funding liberal reforms. Because as you can probably guess, the House of Lords is full of lords. It's full of dukes. It's full of landowners. It's full of people who are not going to benefit from this act. And the way that the Liberal Party frames this is actually in the dialectic of class struggle. They, they frame this as, you know, somewhat rightly, really, as, as, you know, the old landed classes not wanting to pave the way for the, the common folk. But again, it is very much a Marxist couching of ideas in many ways. But and they, that's how this whole thing was done. Yes, I mean, they could have done this in a way to, shall we say, expand individual property ownership. But they didn't mm. do that. It wasn't a case no. of, let's give the people the ability to, to, to 
as Margaret Thatcher did in the 80s. Let's give the, the people in council houses the ability to buy their own council houses, which did wonders for actually a lot of people who were paying rent every, every month in their council house. They turned that rent into a mortgage payment and they got to buy their own house and they got their own house at the end of it. Great, people started owning their own houses. That is property being given to the people. That is giving people property rights and, 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 and maximizing liberty through property. What these guys were doing was they were crippling the land landowners, but the general proletariat, the, the the little guy wasn't gaining any land out of it. No, the parliamentarians were gaining power and money out of it. This it was wasn't, this wasn't the people's budget. This was this was this was the parliament's budget. This was giving the parliament the money, and which is why the Parliament Act is actually quite well named because it is all about parliament, parliamentarians, and this particularly insidious group of ruling elites that is starting to spring up all the way across across Europe and, and America at this point. The parliamentarians. Well, yes. What you can see here is it's, it's the power politics of this. We'll talk about it at the end. We'll talk about the whole era. And, you know, we'll talk about who gains money, who loses money. But through that lens, through who gains power, you can see that this really was not about empowering the British public. This was not about the health of the nation. If you look at it in, in terms of pure power exchange, what happens is that unless you literally believe that Parliament is the virgin, unblemished vessel of the British people who holds its interest in the highest regards, unless you are someone who is out of touch with the reality and doesn't know how human nature works, you, you can't see this as anything other than Parliament empowering itself. Because in the Parliament Act, the, the, they remove the right of the House of Lords to veto monetary bills um, and replaced uh, the right of veto over other public bills with the ability to delay them for a maximum of two years. Um, uh, not not remove them. It, this this was really the gutting of the second chamber, in that the House of Lords they couldn't veto monetary bills at all, and they could only delay public bills. They couldn't veto public bills. So the House of Lords, effectively at this point, becomes powerless. It is no longer a part of the checks and balances system. Um, you know, within the old kind of creaky british establishment you can say what you want about the house of lords you can say that the lords needed some other form of 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 um overhaul but all this does is effectively new to the second chamber and give parliament power that is pretty much absolute yeah i mean i know we we talked about this in the tony blair special we did the other week and that was really the the final nails in the coffin. But you're right. This is the beginnings of the uh, complete disenfranchisement of the second house. And we've we've had a single house of government, and then a bunch of grumbly old farts that really can't do anything, and uh, and a royal family that don't say anything uh, other than rubber stamp anything that comes its way after that. Because quite frankly, the house of parliament would do away with the royal family fairly quickly if Queenie decided to make a stand. Um, and yeah, the House of Lords was, was after this passed, it was gone. There was nothing it could do. Uh, there's also, it, it, it reduced the maximum term of Parliament as a kind of a fig leaf to, to say that they're not getting too powerful from seven years to five. But as you've probably seen in this era, elections generally happened out of season a lot you'd end up with a bit of a crisis in Parliament. Parliament was a lot more dynamic during this period, and there would be a lot more snap elections, there'd be a lot more kind of defeated governments, and Parliament, you know, it it wasn't the rubber stamp it is now, really. You know, if a, if a government is defeated and it has to trigger an election, the media goes mad like it's never happened before. But in the 19th century, that was incredibly common. There were a lot of parliaments that, you know, it was quite routine Parliament didn't reach its full term, and oh, yeah. they had to have an election to resolve an issue. This stopped that in many ways. Well, yeah. This is one of the things that stopped that because they, they, they really had kind of codified the fact that Parliament was, a, was a, a rubber stamp, that they could put things through and there was no longer as much kind of constitutional dynamicism in the UK. But, Again, that's kind of a niche point. I just No, you're right, I, though. You're right, though, because the two prime ministers prior to this, because this is under Asquith. Asquith was 1908 to 1916. But before yeah. that, Bannerman, 1905 to 1908. He had three years. 
Balfour before him, 1902 to 1905. Again, another very, very short term. Frankly, not enough time to do damned all, which there is a good strong argument to say that that's ideal for us. That's a good thing. <laughs> Um, but as far as parliaments themselves is concerned, uh, 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 you know that that's not a good thing. They want as much time to 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 be able to do what they need to do. So four or five years is just about right in some respects. I mean, I've, I've well, yeah, I've... it's it, it's it's good. But I I want to like I said, I want to impress on people really that the argument that they make in terms of empowering the people. In a representative democracy, a as, you know, with the with the same old elite class, is just a way of empowering themselves, and I, I don't think that is an uh, a harsh way of interpreting that, because effectively, in reality, that's what's happening. You don't literally control the government; they are your representatives within this. But what when the power of the state enhances? The power of the individuals who make, you know, who rule the state enhances. It doesn't matter if they represent the people or not, they become more powerful. They do. Anyway, well, I, well, good yeah. law, this is going to be a long stream, but we, we really <laughs> need to move on to a little bit more political theory, I think, unless you have anything else to add about the liberal reform streak. No, no, I think we've touched on the on on the on the the, the crux of it, if you will. Um, I mean, I could, yeah, again, I could ramble on. This is this is part also why the Parliament Act and this and the, it's why they want more and more people in the country because the more people you have in the country, you're not having this, you're not having incrementally more parliamentarians along with those people. So you have the same number of parliamentarians, more public, therefore the general public, each individual ends up with less power because they have the same, have one representative representing significantly more people. So as we grow as a country in terms of populace, each individual gets weaker and weaker and weaker in comparison to the parliament. The parliamentarian, your representative, your your man of the people who's there to, to represent you, is, is significantly more powerful than the individual, as time goes on through this power as well. But, as I said, we can ramble on a, a lot on this one if we're not careful, and I think it's probably a good time to, to move on to <laughs> uh, another one. Another, uh, oh, oh, I... This is a good favourite of mine because uh, wasn't so long ago I read this book. Shall we? Shall we start talking about utilitarianism? We need to, yes, because utilitarianism is something that's often swept under the rug when when people talk about political theory. But it is really one of the first appeals to kind of collectivism. It is really one of the underpinning tenets of what a lot of people use to justify their actions. Mm -hmm. um, it it's it, you know. There's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, I should explain that. That's, that's Jeremy Bentham's head. He was an eccentric and he had it pickled, basically. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get into, we'll get into Bentham and his absolute bat shittery because he was a crazy person. It's pretty, um, it's pretty grim and grisly, that is. Uh, well, that's what he had done. That's what he had done. And it's utilitarianism, really, when it's just uh, distilled down. He, he expressed it as the most good for the most people. Yes. It is really, really classic socialism in, in terms of its thinking patterns. Um, but it was not very well thought of in its age. I don't know, Trig, you've you oh. probably got some... Yes, I mean, I read, I read uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty not so long ago. And alongside it, I had got his, his notes on utilitarianism. And I was very, very disappointed in his take on utilitarianism, because th there was this, this this quite interesting piece of on of on liberty, which is is largely a set of of, of diary notes, essentially, of whilst the whilst the the fight for freedom against the British is is going off in America, and then you've got this utilitarianism piece, which seemed to be John Stuart Mill's sat quietly in a room full of lots of writings on utilitarianism. Having a good old wank. I mean, he really, really, really loved this idea, and he he studied. He became a student of Bentham, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. He did, yes. Yeah. He was one of the students of Bentham. Yeah. He he really John Stuart Mill's really went over the top. He loved utilitarianism. 
time he could not see how this could be anything other than the greatest idea of governance and government there could possibly be, <coughs> because how could there be anything better than to provide the greatest good to the greatest number of people? As I said, the most good for the most people. Not taking into account that that might mean absolute horrific nightmares for 49% of the people, as long as 51% of the people were, were having a right old whale of a time in the process. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, it also, it also comes into something we'll come into later, which is it could just mean that you have a lot of people who are subsisting. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, everyone's surviving, therefore that's the most good for the most people, because there's so many people, we have so few resources, everyone has to subsist. Um, you yeah. get into kind of a... We'll, 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 again, ideas we'll bring in later, but you get into an almost a Malthusian situation, and utilitarianism says that's a good thing, yeah. essentially. It says, well, it's most good for most people, therefore, therefore it is good. But there's... um, Again, we're bringing in Rothbard here, um, there's because Bentham himself, I will restate, was a nutter. He was. He, we'll talk about some of his worst excesses later on. But he was not someone who had a particularly good set of ideas, and he essentially got laughed at in his time because of this. Like people like Ad, you know Adam Smith and his disciples, you know the father of liberal, you know capitalism really in the traditional sense of liberal. You know the classically liberal. He was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. He was someone who was very, very big on property rights. And in his contemporary era, uh, Bentham really just abandoned a lot of the laissez-faire stuff, a lot of the property rights stuff. And um, he denied that he'd ever believed in any kind of self-adjusting and equilibrium tendencies of the market. Um, he went on like, a, a big diatribe here. I think it's on, it's on page um, 72 in the PDF, but it's page 55 of... Um, this is an Austrian perspective on hist history and, and economic thought, volume two, um, by by Rothbard, and he he goes he he reaches into like this this big diatribe against against laissez-faire and property rights, and he says, "I have not, I never have, nor shall, uh, um, right. nor yeah. honor sentimental or um, anarchical of uh, sorry, any honor sentimental uh, or anarchical of the hand of government." I leave it to Adam Smith and the champions of the rights of man to talk of invasions of natural liberty and to give us a special argument against this or that law, an argument that effect of which would be to put a negative upon all laws. The interference of government as often, in my uh, humbled view, uh, jumbled view of matters, the smallest balance on the side of advantage as a result is the event I witness with altogether as much satisfaction as I would forbearance and with much more than I should... Uh, Showed its negligence. Basically, what he's saying is, well, I think government intervention is a good thing, but if you guys want to laugh at me, I'm going to go over here and not talk about economics. Because, um, like I said, he he essentially got blown the fuck out by the people who believed in property rights. Like he he essentially like Bentham's idea of utilitarianism and the common good, and you know the most good for the most people, and the idea that there are only there's only pleasure and pain and you have to you know basically choose between one and you have to balance the needs of every man against every other man and you know essentially it's like the trolley you know the trolley problem shit it's just like well you know if you have to kill 49% of people to save 51% of people you should do that it is pure like binary ethics almost and he essentially throws his toys out of the pram because his thinking ends up as state interventionist it ends up as collectivist and that is not the spirit of the era. Um, this is the late 18th century, the late 1700s. And like I said, he, he basically just gets laughed at. Um, he, he gets torn to shreds because on the face of it, you can see that, that just trying to do the most good for the most people breaks down in so many ways. And everybody kept pointing that out to him in, uh, in many, many, many different ways. Um, there's a little bit here about personal utilitarianism. Um, when it comes to kind of the idea that um, economic, you know, it gives e economists a bit of an out, um, utilitarianism, in that they utilize it in the way by saying, well, this might be bad, but, you know, on balance, it's better. So therefore, it's the utilitarian end, so therefore it's not bad. Um, I don't, you probably have more to say about this as well, Trick. Well, yeah, I mean, it justifies a utilitarian. The, the utilitarian argument justifies almost every single horror 
perpetrated on the populace of any serious socialist, be it national socialist or communistic socialist government. It's for the greater good because the government is the representative of the people. Therefore, this person stands against it or disagrees with our dear leader. So we're going to stick him against the wall. Or in fact, no, we're not. We're going to stand him over here. We're going to shoot his wife in the head first, and then we're going to shoot him in the head. Yeah, because, because that's the greater good of the government that people know not to stand against the government and the state. It uh, does. It's, it, it's, it's really it's a justification of atrocity for greater good, and really, as well, it. It, it becomes subjective because what is good and what is bad is subjective. Yeah. It, it basically means that your personal ethics should be imposed on other people because you believe that is what is for the greater good. And that, that really is the ultimate kind of rhetoric that a lot of the 20th century leaders use that we've seen. It's kind of what Roosevelt uses, you know, Theodore, you know, the older Roosevelt, you know, the, the less shit Roosevelt uses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really the logic that the liberals use. Greatest good for the greatest people. Yep. So it's like greatest good for the greatest amount of people is the justification they're really using in, you know, the people's budget. But, but utilitarianism itself is not an idea that's ever really been in favor explicitly, but implicitly a lot of utilitarian ideas are still used to this day. Yes. And it's exactly the same argument that Stalin was using. It's exactly the same argument that Hitler was using. It's it, literally every single monster that has annihilated vast swathes of their populace has been a utilitarian, quite frankly. It, 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 yeah. It's an absolutely vile ideology that, that smells of roses when you first read it. It looks like it's great. If you are, if you are, you know, if if you if you're just just on the left point of the bell curve, climbing up the the great steep slope into the into the high eighties, this seems like a great idea. Fantastic! Oh, oh yeah, this is the, of course the greatest number of people being happy. How can that not be a great idea? But anybody that can actually sort of step back and subjectively look at this and and, and think, hold on a second, you know. Well, it's. Even with good intentions, the calculation doesn't make sense. Again, here, here Rothbard points out, he said, in addition to the problems of pleasure-pain calculations, personal utilitarianism counsels that actions cannot be judged by their nature, but just by their consequences. But in the non-Benthamite mere cost-benefit analysis, rather than objective pleasure-pain analysis, because they try to kind of objectivize these when you get to Hume and stuff like that, we're kind of skipping over that a bit. Uh, how is anyone to gauge the consequences of any action? And why is it considered easier, let alone scientific, to judge consequences rather than to judge the act itself by its nature? Uh, furthermore, it is often difficult to figure out what the consequences of any uh, contemplated action will be. How are we to find the secondary, tertiary, etc. consequences, let alone the immediate ones? So there is, again, there is, there is, you, you, you can't calculate outcomes before actions. And utilitarianism, again, is a... It's a deterministic view yes. uh, of, of history. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you are, if you are heavily religious, like, again, it falls, falls well within, within Hegel's determinism and, 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 and a, a religious outlook. It, 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 it seems like it's, it's the thing. And, and yes, I find it sounds great. It sounds, it sounds great at first good. reading. It sounds great at first reading. As I said, it smells of roses when you first read it, and you're like, you know what? This 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 is actually pretty. Good. This, you know, there's something that's not quite right about this. Let me have a bit of a think. That's that's that. You if you don't have that little bit coming into your head as you're reading it, it you could very easily come come running away, um, run away with utilitarianism, thinking this is great. It it's it is very the needs of the few. Sorry, the needs of the many outweigh the the needs of the few or the one. Um, to to go a bit Star Trek on us. Um, it is it is very much that. It is very very hard logic, but it's not hard logic because it's the wrong view to take. It needs to be thrown away in completion and go, no, that's a terrible idea. Let's come up with a, bit, a better lens, a better way of looking at the situation than this absolute abortion of an idea. Because you are going to make 
absolutely horrific, horrific mistakes, and you're going to completely justify them. You're going to cause huge, catastrophic disasters to people. You're going to hold back the progress of technology because you don't want that technology to... to you, could, you, you could argue very quickly that the car is going to put out all of these, all of these cart makers out of business. So we, we must hold back this technology for the greater utility. Well, again, it, it becomes what is good in this, in this simplistic analysis is yeah. subjective. Exactly. And there's, there's also, um, when you get derived utilitarianism, when you get like, utilitarianism from Mills, Bentham himself was not a Christian. He was not someone who believed in in okay. in a god, but he he espoused to. He he really he put his utilitarian uh, philosophy in very very religious terms. He really him and Mills tried to sell this ideology mm. to kind of the the Protestant strident Britain that thought of itself as you know able to. Uh, put its will on the world and able to change the world through their fervor and really giving them ideas like utilitarianism is, is it's a bit like giving a monkey a hand grenade you are you are giving like religious <laughs> nutters a sense that they can not only affect reality and that reality you know that their theological deterministic view of the world is right but you're telling them that they can make a judgment on a mass scale about what is good what is bad, and then they can implement that. And hmm. doing that is an act of altruism. Doing that is an act of good, that they can make moral judgments about entire societies and implement the most good for the most people, in quotes, from their own perspective. And that, that is a, an, a, you know, a wonderful thing to do. It is, it's, it's a terrifying notion when you add it to a, a bunch of theocratic people. It's, it's, it, it gets really, really dark really, really fast. There's, there's part of me that wants to argue the uh, the positive side of giving monkeys hand grenades. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to go there at the present moment. Just don't be near it and don't have it near other people. And this is the problem is this is not this is a, 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 a political philosophy that affects massive amounts of people. If it was just one person playing a, in, an individual utilitarian uh, that, that, that is just looking after himself and, and you know, then actually utilitarianism is perfectly reasonable as an individual's philosophy for himself you know and does it make me happy then yes i will go and do that does it make me sad and then no, i'm probably not going to do that probably not going to have any long-term planning ability probably no, not going to have any capability of delayed gratification but you know they might get by day to day as a utilitarian um but Roll that up into state level, and again, you've got no pro, not no long term planning. You've got no capability for delayed gratification. Well, you've got no, you can, literally no capability for 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 future thinking whatsoever is provided by utilitarianism. Well, there's the, I'll, I'll round this off. We're going to have to move on quickly to the the worst concept of utilitarianism. But the, there's Rothbard really takes a big swipe at Bentham here. I think. <laughs> And he, he says um, on page 62 of Classical Economics that Bentham's utilitarianism led him to an increasingly numerous agenda for government intervention in the economy. Some of his agenda we have seen above. Other items include <clears throat> a welfare state, taxation for at least a partial egalitarian redistribution of wealth, government bonds, institution universities, public works to cure unemployment as well as encourage private investment, government insurance, regulation of banks and stockbrokers, and the guarantee of the quality of goods. It's pure progressivism. Yes. Um, and Bentham's ideas of, you know, like, uh, that have horrendous totalitarian outcomes at the end of them really do just underpin the shallow thinking of, of interventionist and redistributionist economies. That, that really is what I want to demonstrate here, that that Bentham's ideas that come from, again, this extremely deterministic Protestant perspective, mm -hmm. even though he himself is an atheist, he's essentially being a snake oil salesman with these ideas. He's, he's out there trying to sell shit to people, essentially. And, and what he thinks is that, well, you know, let's just have a big, a big state and then the big state can do it. Yep. Essentially, is one of his... I don't know, he got very rambly with it. 
But the the biggest and part of the cover image for this series, actually, the biggest problem and the biggest issue with Bentham is his fanatical belief in the Panopticon. Uh, uh, okay, now I, ju just in case people don't understand the Panopticon, and it, it's very understandable why they wouldn't, but the the, the image itself is is almost self-explanatory. If you don't know what you're looking at, there, the Panopticon is. Some people think it's just a prison, and it is not. The prison is a very, very good uh, representation of it, though. It is the idea that an all-seeing eye can see everybody and everything within that, in this case, a prison. All the prisoners in this prison are in uh, rooms that are visible through a central tower that can view everything and everybody that is in that prison at all times. Whether or not they are being viewed, everyone knows that they can be viewed. And the idea is that, as a result, they will be compelled to behave themselves because they know that they might be being watched. Which we don't perhaps live in something that looks exactly like that these days, but with surveillance state, uh, CCTV camera surveillance of absolutely everything and everywhere you go, and now the internet and mobile phones monitoring everything that you watch and do, uh, we have pre reached peak Panopticon at this particular point in time. It is the, very, done, yes. the very definition of, of the 1984's Big Brother. And so, yes, Google. Well, uh, to, to explain <laughs> people in basic principles, the Panopticon as a building, a Panopticon is somewhere where someone can be observed where they don't know they are being observed. The idea of the Panopticon, um, the, the prison idea of Panopticon itself, is actually more of a proof of concept. Hmm. Bentham wanted this structure to actually be built and spent much of his you know, fortune and much of his time in his later years trying to get it built. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that he wanted to prove that by not knowing whether they were observed or not. Because the way the Panopticon works is you have a central tower that, through a series of mirrors, the warden can see into every cell, but the inmate does not know if they are being observed or not. Therefore, he posits that everyone will always behave like they are being observed. And he believes this to be the ultimate form of control. But he doesn't think that's a bad thing. In fact, he thinks it's a good thing. And the Panopticon is, is, is often used as a, as a vision of hell, almost, for people. It's a vision of the complete destruction of personal freedom as a structure. It is, it is a cruel form of punishment and imprisonment because the inmate has, effectively has no privacy. The privacy is completely stripped from him. Um, he, and he doesn't know if he's being watched or not, which is, again, almost like a form of psychological warfare. But the Panopticon as a prison is just a physical proof of concept. The Panopticon as an idea is often put forward as a modern reinterpretation, but it isn't. I don't, I don't know if you... If I've, got news for, I've, got, I've got news for you. It was built. It was built yeah, in it was built. No, no. It was built in... They built it in Cuba. And here's a picture of it now. I just, I just slapped it up. Yeah, well, there's these, been a few examples. There's been it, yeah. quite a few examples of it. Yeah, this is this is not just a concept. This has this this hellish idea. And in fact, there's, there was a... Oh, what was the film? Um... I can't remember it now, but there was a film about about a prison like this, almost exactly this design, um, where essentially one warden, with the help of a, of a bunch of robots and machines, was running a giant underground prison that was essentially a converted silo that looked exactly like this. There was no daylight, no nothing, and every single cell was open and uh, and and viewable by the prison warden. And the prison warden was this weird. It, can't remember the name of the film. It will come to me. It wasn't a particularly big film at the time, but I, I, I'm dying to remember what it's called now. Um, well, the, the the thing is, as we've talked about, utilitarianism informs a lot of uh, politics in this era and a lot of modern politics as well. It really, yeah. the thinking of progressivism and the thinking of the liberal reforms and the, the later thinking of, of, as we'll come to Woodrow Wilson, was informed by utilitarianism. It is all utilitarian in nature, in that it claims to maximize the most good for the most people. Yeah. But the founder of utilitarianism sees the Panopticon as the ultimate form of utilitarianism. This is the ultimate utilitarian structure. 
And to go back to Rothbard's work here, um, in the chapter named Jeremy Bentham, the Utilitarian, his big brother, again, we're reading an, an Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought here. This is page 63. But th- th- he just absolutely picks Bentham apart here. He says, Bentham's apologists have reduced this scheme to merely one of prison. But Bentham tried to make it clear that all social institutions would have been encompassed by the Panopticon, that it was to serve as the model for, and he quotes him here, houses of industry, workhouses, poorhouses, manufactories, madhouses, um, lazaratos, hospitals, and schools. Um, an atheist, uh, hardly given to scriptural citation, Bentham nevertheless waxed, uh, waxed um, rhapsodic about the social ideal of the Panopticon, quoting Psalms, Thou art my path and my bed, and all spies out my ways. Um, I, there's, he quotes someone here which has an amazing name called Professor Himmelflab. Which is Himmelflab. <laughs> you know what, I've known, I know that, I, I'm sure I know that name, but it sounds like a meme name. Himmelflab is a great name. It does. <laughs> yeah, um, as, as Himmel, Himmelflab... Aptly puts it, Bentham did not believe in God, but he did believe in the quantities apophysized for God. The Panopticon was a realization of his divine ideal, spying out the ways uh, of the transgressor by means of an ingenious architectural scheme, turning night into day with artificial light and reflectors, holding man captive by an intricate system of inspection. Bentham's goal was to appropriate or simulate the ideal perfection of complete and continuous inspection of everyone. Because of the inspector's invisible eye, each inmate would uh, conceive himself in a state of total and continuing inspection, thus achieving an apparent omnipresence in the inspector. Consistent with utilitarianism, the social arrangement was decided upon by the social despot who acts scientifically um, in the name of the greatest happiness for all. In that name, his rule maximizes the efficiency, which in utilitarianism is often kind of conflated with you know, what is ethical. I think it's a part we skipped over, but really the, the, the main failing in, in ethical terms is that, again, like communism, u- utilitarianism confuses efficiency with you know, what is ethical. Yeah. Uh, thus, in Bentham's original draft, every inmate would be kept in, consor- in solitary confinement. This would maximize being safe and quiet without chance of unruly crowds or planning of escape. In arguing for this panopticon, Bentham has at one point acknowledged his doubts and reservations of people who appear to want maximum inspection of children or other changes. He recognizes as possible change that is that the, the inspector would be excessively despotic, or even that the incarceration sort of confinement might be a um, productive, in, you know, of imbecility. So essentially, he's he's. His his main concern about this is well maybe I'm going to turn people into like mentally retarded people because mm-hmm. of how severe this is, um, but but really he just goes on to say that um, you know he's only willing to concede that they shouldn't be in solitary confinement. He still believes that this is the ideal social arrangement for human beings. Like I said, in poor houses, in workhouses, manufactories, hospitals, and schools, houses of industry. He believes that they should all be panopticons. He's a monster. You know, it reminds me of... I, I'm, I'm sure you've played the game, uh, the original Deus Ex. Not one of the remakes, yes. the original Deus Ex. J.C. Denton has, is, is going through a whole series of quests, and there are, there are some great moments in that game. But there is a fantastic question when he meets a, a true AI that has been trying to guide him uh, through a series of quests. And the conversation he has with that AI is 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 very very definitely panopticon based. Where he yeah. the, the the AI is is sat there going, "I'm the replacement of God. God you do you, mankind does not need a God. Mankind has always needed a God up until now to be judged, to be ruled over, and 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 to be un- observed and to be eventually judged. And now with the ev- with with surveillance states." heuristics and um, data mining algorithms, we have the ability to view mankind at all times, judge him and find him guilty and punish him accordingly at almost immediately. And that is the future. And uh, and obviously this is the the, hor- the horrendous ending you could go for is to, to give power to that. And on anyone that's not a total psychopath obviously does not want that. But it, it's, it's amazing because that 
if you haven't played that game, anyone that hasn't played the original Deus Ex, really old game now, go back, find that game, dig it up. It's probably free on a abandoned ware site or something. Get it, have a run through of it, or at least watch a playthrough of it. There's some of this content in that game is absolutely amazing and really, really prescient to now because the whole of the game is is set in 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 a world where a virus has been released on the world and the uh, the vaccine is being controlled. The chat's the chat's now just quoting Deus Ex. Yeah, and yes, I will say uh, I will say uh, my favorite line from that is still why can why contain it? It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. I I quite like the the get a job. <laughs> oh dear, Punch, punching all. I, I Deus Ex is great. What a, what a great game. But fantastic we're, again, game. Getting yeah, a little bit off. We got still got quite a bit to cover, and we're already two and two hours and ten minutes in. So. Told you, told you we could take we just want, Again, this is this is another section of theory, really, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and talk about utilitarianism because I think the biggest villain of this period, and we'll see him coming forward. Um, is is Woodrow Wilson? We're gonna to have to talk about Woodrow Wilson because uh-huh. we we kind yeah. of we've kind of skipped over the Taft era. Taft was a single term president. He was beset by challenges from Democrats. He lost a lot of state houses, and like I said, he's 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 mainly known for being a bigger trust bust than Roosevelt was. Um, but after Taft, you get Woodrow Wilson, who on the face of it seemed like an unlikely person. He seemed like an unlikely uh, kind of figure to be this great progressive leader and this great expansion of this you know of the state but once again we we've we've brought you here via the political theory to show you that you know Woodrow Wilson was someone who was very interested in Hegel he was inspired by a lot of like Marxist economists as well mm-hmm. um he was kind of almost like the he once again is more nakedly than even someone like Lord George at the period he's like the the synthesis, really, of the establishment, Hegel and Marx. He he is somebody again through his own writings, as we'll, as we'll see, believes that he is, you know, the elite who who will bring about the socialistic change that is needed at the speed that is required. Um, he he's all he's he's pretty masked off with it in the end, really. Um, he, he is somebody who believes that, again, that the, the socialist experiment needs to be controlled by the elites, and that is how he, he, he and the Democratic Party will retain power. It's, it's amazing when you see, you see how openly he talks about it. Uh, and again, we, we, we are quoting the Mises Institute here, and with, you know the disastrous legacy of Woodrow Wilson, if you got up there. Yep. Um, we're probably not going to read a lot from it. We're going to have to skim a little bit here. Uh, because there's a couple of key things. I don't know, Trey. From your reading of Woodrow Wilson, what's, what's your impression of the man? Uh, you know, I, this is not my strong point. I, I, I didn't completely cover Woodrow Wilson. Um, Jim Crow era, racial segregation, all sorts of very nasty sort of things that have left a very, very, very bad taste in America's mouth. For a, a long time since, is 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 all down to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he was certainly not someone that I would. Uh... Well, but I wouldn't say it was all down to him, but he certainly no. codified it in law. Yeah, <laughs> precisely. Um, he 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 was not. He certainly wasn't someone that had looked at the Constitution and said, "Okay, okay, I'm going to protect this wholeheartedly." He wanted to rewrite a big chunk of the Constitution in his own image. Uh, there was, I don't know. I why why don't you carry on on this one? Because there's a, this isn't this isn't my strongest one. I can rant about a number of subjects on this one, but Woodrow Wilson. I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to step back and he's, he's not my favorite man of history. He, uh, if I remember rightly, he kept America out of the first world war for a very, very long time and could have ended it in the process. Uh, well, well, <laughs> we'll get to the first world war on another, on another episode. Uh, we've got another uh, super chat here from um, Kismol, just before I launch into my attack, savage attack on Woodrow Wilson. Um, so you've uh, Burnham and Rothbard. When are you going to break into Molberg? Um, we're skipping right over uh, Manchester Molberg or whatever the hell he calls himself because he's a bit cringe. 
Uh, we're going to skip over Molberg and in later episodes go right to Ted Kaczynski. Because <laughs> uh, Ted Kaczynski actually has quite a lot of good things to say in the end about democracy. But we we won't be covering Molberg. I don't think he's actually particularly worth covering. Um, bit of a cringe. All, all, you know, he, he's essentially a 70s version of a, of a right-wing blogger. It'd be like us, you know, putting Zero Hedge up here now. It's uh, yeah. not something I'm particularly interested in uh, oh, in using as an academic source. Magoot has just pointed out something, and of course it's just clicked. The Anti-Espionage Act, which is yes. which is these days being used on people like... Uh, what's his name? WikiLeaks. Uh, Julian Assange. Assange. Yes. Assange. Anti-Espionage. Not that he was an American citizen, but, you know, anti-espionage. It... it, it Woodrow Wilson put some really, really fucking horrible laws into place. Excuse my, excuse my French, but good, good God, he was yeah, he was not, not my favorite president. But um, I, 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 you, you have a bash. Let me, let me chip. I will chip well, in. Well, the, <laughs> the the article here from the Mises Institute um, about Woodrow Wilson mm. quite rightly identifies that he is condemned in a modern sense for his extreme. And even extreme for the time, racism. He was a, an avowed white supremacist. And he was, a, again, a patrician who believed that the ruling class of America should be the ones to in, implement socialism, not some rabble from the bottom. His biggest problem with socialism was how egalitarian it was. <laughs> not, not the, not the uh, horrendous end point of its utilitarian ideas and its kind of robbing of Hegel's deterministic kind of uh, Christian ethic. It, you know, all things through God, all things through the state. He had no problem with that. His problem was that other people would be in charge, uh, as we'll get to later. Uh, there's, I actually found a great university thesis on this we'll be using a little bit. But the the uh, article here from the Mises Institute by uh, William L. Anderson um, rightly identifies the fact that the reading of history in which Wilson is a hero does not question his expansion of the state. It does not question his expansion of the role of the presidency. It does not question his warmongering. It doesn't question the fact that he went and essentially destroyed the last vestiges of the U.S. Republic. Like, I, I would consider Woodrow Wilson really, you know, the Republic was limping at this stage. You know, mm. it, it had been a little bit tattered. The, the principles of the Founding Fathers had been tested very much so, you know, in the trauma of the Civil War and, and, and thereafter. But this is really the death of the American Republic. Um, Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. essentially redefines the president almost as a king. He, he is the man who would be king in this sense. And we'll, I'll go through some of the actual evidence for that later. But the, the, the actions he took and the the expansion of state power that was impressed into in U.S. history at that stage is never questioned in traditional historiography. It is seen as a good thing. It is the thing he is praised for and he is condemned for his racism. So uh, that is the main thrust of, of kind of the, the disaster here. Um, but yeah, the, it's it is something like I said that is just it's just completely glossed over the fact that he was somebody. Who who really just aggrandized himself, um, and and destroyed the separations of power, and essentially, you know, we 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 don't have time to talk about natural law here. That's a that's a concept for another day. But, but <laughs> what he did was really is he he moved the ethos of America away from the naturalistic rights of yes. the founding fathers and towards the state-based positive rights of what would become kind of the later dependent welfare states and the more socialistic states. He, he was that breaking point, uh, and he, he did it to a, a very, very high degree. That There was no real pretense here that the U.S. Constitution, um, it, actually ha it actually happened under Taft, but one of the biggest changes was the fact that the 16th Amendment had passed, which paved the way for an income tax. Because previously, you know, the Wilson era Democrats argued rather futilely um, that the uh, the imposition of an income tax wasn't a direct tax. For those of you who don't know, the Tenth Amendment said that the Americans can't have direct taxes levied at them; that those things are unconstitutional. And the argument that an income tax is not a direct tax is a nonsensical one, in my opinion. It is very it's it's like oh it's it's like an argument. It's how we get to the stage of the Second Amendment only applies to muskets. It's that kind of argument. It's just saying that even though the Constitution says this, we want to do something else, so we'll pretend that doesn't happen. 
it it really does just remove the last vestige of of the of the founding fathers' vision of America wasn't from it, from being a yeah. Wasn't it the Sixteenth Amendment that was passed in the middle of the night with a, with a, an incomplete quorum of people actually sitting at the time? Yes, um, uh, but and, it was uh, it was ratified by the states eventually. Of course, they had a bit was. of a hard time with it, but the the Democrats had taken over enough states to ratify it by that point. Yeah, which so was the real falling down point. An illegal an illegal amendment creating a massive amounts of wealth for the state, and suddenly lots of states decided, yeah, no, maybe not a bad idea. Look, no, look, look at all this money I'm now rolling in. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, one thing that Biden has recently said is that no amendment is uh, <laughs> is beyond being removed at the moment. I know he was talking about the second, but uh, I'd say anything from the 13th onwards is probably worth looking at, um, if it's up for, up for grabs. But yes, the 16th Amendment is an absolute freaking disgrace. As is anything that, to do with income tax, quite frankly. Um, it is, yes. It's it it is it is a real like I said it was um, it, he Wilson's also a, a progressive in the truest sense in that his view of history is a postmodern one um, he he, he Fucking again the the progressive view of history which we'll get into later says that you can't understand objective facts basically it says that you can't understand facts outside of their historical context so trying to do so is useless and you must also you must always filter facts through the age you are in. Therefore, all facts are subjective, is what that says. Um, it is, <laughs> again... <clears throat> okay. All yeah, facts he, he are was subjective. Inspired, yeah. Oh, he was oh, inspired oh. by Marx economically, and he was inspired by Hegel in terms of his the justification for statehood and the massive increase of executive power, which we'll get to uh, momentarily. Um, do, do you have... I don't know if, what page it's on, but there's... Uh, ah, there it is. Sorry, I'm I'm quoting somebody's. I think it's a university thesis here. Um, if you want to get it's. Oh, it's, oh, oh, yeah. yes, that's. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? This is this is a piece by Christopher F. Fisher from Salve Regina University, um, and it's a paper entitled "Progressivism and the Executive Branch: Woodrow Wilson's Expansion of Presidential Power." Um, there's a lot of good stuff in the body of it. Unfortunately, we don't really have time to read it here. But there's some actually some other great stuff in his notes as well. You know, let's let's um, give him an actual actual view on the title. Yes, because Christopher Fisher has written a really really good thesis here. Yes, really he good, really good. And uh, as you say, it's probably his university thesis. And um, hats off to the man. It's it's a good one, but it's it's I think it's buried on page twenty five there in the middle of the page. Oh, I'm on twenty four, um, so we're, we're nearly there. There we go. It's 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 a case of he's talking about the fact that really the industrial workers had to be convinced that Woodrow Wilson needed to come and rescue them, because um, yeah, uh, between the years eighteen twenty and eighteen seventy, per, per capita income had increased by ninety four percent. Um, four of the years of the industrial revolution between nineteen um, between eighteen seventy and nineteen thirteen, the income per, ta- per capita income had increased by one hundred and eighteen percent. Furthermore, the manufacturing wage earners consistently made more money than a farmer did. Um, and what happened is Woodrow Wilson came in, and his thesis was that because the industrial worker no longer lived on the land, and because the industrial worker you know, no longer had the homestead, as as he puts it, um, that he could, you know, yeah, uh, he he could essentially come in and and uh, take over, and he could essentially come in and take over that that role that the you know the frontiersman and the homestead had um, th- as a buffer that protected them. He saw himself as kind of you know the fence and the land of the industrial worker. That's how he put himself forward. I think it's on page 30 as well. It says, uh, Wilson and labor union leaders um, critique corporations for many of the same reasons. Um, and he talks about the fact that, um, you know, in this new age, we find, for instance, that our laws with regards to the relations of employer and employee are in many respects wholly inadequate and impossible. Um, he basically, him and the union bosses basically have to go around and tell people they're suffering when, when they're not. That the industrial revolution has enriched them. They yeah. are doing much better than they were. Like you said, a hundred and eighteen percent rise in wages in forty years is massive, and that is not with modern inflation levels. 
that is like a real, almost like a real rise there because inflation and deflation was allowed to happen naturally at this point. This is, yeah. you know, this is all pre-Fed, um, as we'll get to later. But, the, you know, the, the, the lot of the industrial work in America has got a, a damn sight better since the 1870s. Um, and Wilson's justification for his massive, massive increase in executive power, um, he essentially just... To, to sum it up in, in quick terms, what he did was he basically made it so that the president is the one who proposes bills. That wasn't the case beforehand. The president was supposed to be quite hands-off. He also made it so it was, it, you know, he started kind of what became the tradition of the executive order. That didn't, you know, that didn't take form under, under Woodrow Wilson, but his defining of the president as the person with supreme executive power was a redefining that did not exist. And everyone else since then has tried to take up the mantle of Woodrow Wilson. But he shattered the separation of powers by doing that. And he did so under the guise of being the vessel of the people. His core argument was that he was the vessel of the people, therefore his power should be superior to all other parts of state because, you know, he was, he was the, he was the um, avatar of democracy in his view. <laughs> and that, made, that, that imbued him, yeah, that imbued him essentially with, with superpowers that transcended what the founding fathers thought was appropriate. It, it, it imbued him with um, the idea that, you know, he could stand above all the other branches of government legitimately because he derives power from the people and therefore, you know, he is king. That, that, is, that is, the you know, in simple terms, the big, the big thing that Woodrow Wilson did. Um, in many respects, this is when the, your, your boog should have happened. This is, this is the guy that, that, that started a lot, well, propelled a lot of the rot that we're seeing today, just, just running away with itself. This is, this is when they should have gone, you know what, we start, just, just built our country and this guy's undermining it. This guy is is destroying the libertarian state that is what could have been the great united states of america instead it's it's not and now you're heading more into the united socialist states of america um and yeah absolutely i mean even though i mean wilson's often sort of considered to be it says that he he rejected socialism but i would disagree with that he rejected a couple well, of tenets of it but he was a massive statist Absolute the thing is, he, massive statist. His rejection of socialism comes from a point of elitism. Yeah. Um, as as a lot of the analysis of his writing, again, I'm going to have to skim over a lot of the specifics of it. We might have to do something on Woodrow Wilson in future. But <laughs> a lot of his writing goes out of its way to say that, even though he he likes the tenets of socialism, he thinks, you know, he do, he doesn't like the revolutionary tenets of socialism. Because they might target him, yeah. you know. What, what what if it happens to me? Kind of thing. Um, it's, it's there's a big big component of that in what Woodrow Wilson does and says. In that again, it's you know a lot of people talk about conservatives being leftists doing the speed limit. Well, you know, progressives really were just communists doing the speed limit. Yeah. Um, that you know he 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 talks about merging men into an ever more integrated society. It really is ju just that. Um, parlance in in the in the language of reform, um, and he's relatively open about it. And it's amazing that he was never, you know, it was never as called out as it should be at the time. It was never called out as much as it should be since. Um, the other the other big point one of one of the first actions of Woodrow Wilson um, was to he lowered trade tariffs and he. Uh, Established, he established corporation tax, the Revenue Act of 1913. Um, the 16th Amendment had paved the way for it, but Woodrow Wilson was the person who implemented American income tax. And in doing so, massively empowered what would become the IRS. Mm. Um, and again, <laughs> he also massively empowered his own coffers. Um, he, yeah, he, the, the, the US populace had to be, again, convinced through all this. This wasn't something that was being massively called for even though there were a lot of drafts of income tax before and it had been ruled multiple times unconstitutional that's why the 16th amendment needs to be passed but like i said the revenue act of 1913 is what established income tax so in a short space of time you know he's been in power a year and you already have income tax and corporation tax 
You already have the fact that he thinks he can legislate from his office. He thinks he should be in charge of the legislative you know, agenda of, of, um, of Congress. And essentially through the establishment, through the kind of deep state he creates in, in this way, and the, the empowerment of his version of bureaucracy and expansionism, it makes it more difficult to you know, repeal the state because he essentially entrenches his vision in the federal system of America. He, he, it goes from the checks and balances of the Founding Fathers to the progressivism of Wilson. And he, yeah. he, is, he becomes so powerful and exercises his power so completely, he warps the system around him. And I'm sure you'll have a, a lot more to say about this part of it. The, the biggest symptom of that, I think, and the biggest contribution <laughs> of Wilson's early era before we get to World War I is the Fed. And the Fed is an extremely important part of the story. Ugh. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've just glossed over Wilson there. Please, but what please. I will say that Wilson, Wilson is Hegelianism and, you know, mask off Machiavellian power accruing personified. He yeah. is the Hegelian justification for personal power as a person <laughs> at this stage. He, like I said, he is essentially turning the presidency from uh, you know an office in a larger government to a king. Yes. As I said, this is when this is when you, they should have gone. Oh, okay, it's all gone to shit. Let's shoot them and start again. But they didn't. Uh, the thing is, though, <laughs> it was it was couched in a way that people wanted in exactly. many ways. It, um, it, it always was, is. Always he was, is. He was pretending to give people what you know. Not, not even what they wanted, what, what they thought they wanted. He was telling people what they wanted and giving it to them. Mm. But a lot of people, they weren't sure what would happen with this. They like said, we're, we're looking at it from a, a, an outcomes perspective. You know, here we are in 2021. But back then, really, yes, a lot of what he did was very unpopular, as we'll come to with the Fed, because the Fed was essentially, you know, set up as a conspiracy at first. But, you know, eventually it was learned to be accepted because it claimed to solve a lot of the problems that had been caused at the time. But, yeah, the, the, the oh. Revenue Act of 1913 <laughs> already, we see Woodrow Wilson not only enhancing his power, but his revenue. Um, and there, there is no way to view Wilson as anything but a massive power grab by the executive branch. And in, in, in the process, he also just enhances the size of every part of government. You know, he inherits this stuff from, uh, you know, from the limp Taft. He didn't have a good administration. He inherits the 16th Amendment and he inherits Roosevelt's enhancement of the institutions. He, he inherits, you know, a lot of what has been put in place to try and combat the, the captains of industry age of, you know, what he's seen as unfair monopolies. And really that kind of trauma and that hangover of, of that experience in the Industrial Revolution is what allows him to do this. He is provided cover by, you know, democracy, by being, you know, the vessel of the people. And he actively utilizes that. He actively weaponizes that. Uh, and he goes much further than people want him to. He kind of, he takes what he considers a mandate and runs with it. Um, again, he's, he is a great example of what we've come to accept in modern politics, but what was unusual at the time. Yeah, it's the beginning of what we've seen time and time again. And the yeah the one percent tax back then, I can understand yes. why people were just oh it's it's one percent. What's well one, the problem what's is one percent. You know it's nothing. It along was... with the incorporation requirements that Roosevelt did, it gives the American government unprecedented access to information. Yeah. Well, it, well yes. You now have to tell the government what your company earns. Yep. That yeah. is that is the, the the big point of that, but yeah, the the the, the biggest thing and the, the kind of the last part of the story before we get to the conclusions here because we're two and a half hours in <laughs> is really the the Revenue Act is kind of partnered with the Fed. It's like a one-two economic punch. Oh, fuck the Fed. The thing, I mean, are we going to go move on to the Fed now? Because the the the, the other thing, the big, I've got things to say about the Fed. Um, go, go ahead, yeah. Because the Fed is is. It's a private organization. This is not some big government owned, you know, for the people well, national bank. It it it's it's couched in those terms, but it really is 
it's 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 a banking cartel it's a mafia it's it's a private organization that's sold as a way of 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 stabilizing the economy and this that and the other but by and large it's a mechanism for printing money to a government and to a people and then charging them interest on that so that so that they there is absolutely no way they can possibly pay it back because even if they rounded up all of the money they've got and paid it back into the Fed, there's already interest on there for them to, to require more. That it, Just at the very, very basics, it is a, a, a gigantic con and it necessitates, it creates and necessitates an inflationary uh, economic system by its very existence. So every single year from this day onwards, the moment the Fed is in, is is created, from th this day onwards, your money is going to get progressively less valuable, whether you like it or not. No matter what you do, every dollar this year is worth less than a dollar was last year, and less than a dollar was last year, the year before that, and so on. You will continuously losing the value out of the dollar from the moment this is created you are well, always going to get thing is, this this is supposed to emulate the argument for the federal reserve was that it would emulate the central banks of europe but it didn't no um the bank of england at the in the 19th century we'll probably have to talk about the bank of england when its role gets expanded later on i i, I deliberately had to leave it out of this because you can as you can see where we're way past time, but um, the Bank of England really just controls money supply, or did at the period. It minted money, and it was really just, it wasn't responsible for monetary policy, and it wasn't responsible, and it wasn't accountable, and it wasn't controlled by the banks. It was a government institution that controlled the money supply, the printing of money, and the holding of assets for the nation. It was not part of a, like, like the Federal Reserve became a banking cartel. That is not what it was at this point, and and never really what it became either. You you don't have the same kind of thing as the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. You you kind of never do. I mean, a, a government did kind of pass on some monetary policy stuff to it, like way down the line. But you you never have a situation where it is a Federal Reserve like entity. The Federal Reserve, we should probably go into a little bit of the 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 history of why it ended up coming about. Um, because initially the Federal Reserve, like I said, was a conspiracy. And it was a conspiracy by the New York bankers. Like, very, very even the Federal Reserve history kind of admits this. Are we, uh, are we talking about a certain meeting at, uh, yes. at Jackal Island? <laughs> yes. A secret gathering at a scheduled island off the coast of Georgia. 1910 laid the foundations for the Federal Reserve. Yeah, Jackal Island is right. This is a perfect name for it. Bunch of fucking jackals, the lot of them. Uh, six men. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> In November 1910, six men. Nelson Aldrich, A. Piet Andrew, Henry Davidson, Arthur Shelton, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Wahlberg met Jackal Island Club off the coast of Georgia to write a plan to reform the nation's banking system. The meeting and its purpose were closely guarded secrets and the participants did not want to admit that the meeting occurred until the 1930s. As you said, this is, this is one, of your, one of your earliest. Oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Oh, actually, no, it's true. Uh, yeah. But the plan <laughs> in on Jack and I and lay the foundations to what would eventually be the Fed's Federal Reserve System. Yeah, this is this is absolutely no, this didn't happen. No, 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 absolutely, of course not. No, 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 no. Don't talk nonsense. You're just a conspiracy theorist. Actually, yeah, it happened. You're fucked now. Ha <laughs> get fucked, pauper. Um, that's this is it. This is you know. <laughs> We've been building up to these things for a long time, haven't we? Um, the need for reform. At a time, the men who met at Jackal Island believing the banking system suffered from a serious from serious problems. The Jackal Island participants' views on this issue are well known. Since before and after their conclave, several spoke publicly and others publicly uh, published extensively on the topic. Collectively, they encapsulated their concerns in the plan that they wrote on Jackal Island and the reports or to the Monetary well, this, Commission. This is essentially apologism, because this is from the Federal yeah. Reserve's website. It is, But what isn't happened it? was... Go on. 
I, we don't have time to cover it, but the, uh, in full, but there was in 1907 what was known as the Knickerbocker Crisis, where essentially America mm. had grown so much so fast that the amount of goods outstripped the money supply. Um, and what happened was essentially nothing was done, and it fixed the problem by itself because deflation happened, and then the amount of goods did match the amount of currency. You know, currency became more valuable because there wasn't enough money around. There was a money supply problem. But the bankers are the ones who lost out on this. Basically, what happened was there was a, a small V-shaped kind of economic adjustment that didn't actually affect a huge amount of people that badly. But it was seen as this kind of a bit of a scandal at the time. It was, you know, the, uh, the meeting of six was done in secret, um, let's not forget. Mm -hmm. um, and this, is gone, this isn't gone into here because the populace of the U.S. was so diametrically opposed to the idea of a Federal Reserve. They did not want the power, these powerful bankers to have codified control. They didn't want the establishment of a central bank because they hated these people so much because they are the people who brought about a lot of these, you know, crashes in the previous few decades. There was a lot of instability, but there wasn't the kind of situation that would bring about like we see with the Great Depression because you have a lot of private banking and you don't have this codified cartel. You don't have this monopolization that they have on the money supply. Um, an additional member as well of this is a, is a person called Benjamin Strong, um, vice president of the Bankers Trust Company. And yes. uh, he eventually ended up becoming governor of, of the Fed, but he was again part of this conspiracy. And what he did was really what they came up with, with, with the existence, the existence of, of Benjamin Strong was called the Aldrich Plan, um, drafted by the men during this conference. And the plan was written in secrecy because, the, like I said, the, the public would have lynched them if they'd known about this. Like, oh, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, the bankers were, the, were all prominent New York bankers. Um, the, the, the Democrats, the Aldrich plan was kind of drafted and um, uh, was put to Congress in 1912, but it wasn't popular enough in 1912. Um, after the election uh, in November, Woodrow Wilson um, then decided to bring... He brought this hated Aldrich plan from these New York bankers, from these people who were trying to make themselves into a banking monopoly cartel. And he brought that, uh, or at least pretended to bring it, into the uh, public domain. Um, or at least he said it would be publicly controlled. Um, he, he decided to create what would become the Federal Reserve System. Um, in that he would create the Western and Southern districts. He would create basically the Federal Reserve System in which each state would have its own Federal Reserve Board. Um, but uh, as, is this, as is the case with powerful you know, power centers, um, states like New York would be much more powerful than the other Federal Reserve Boards were. And uh, by the way, the Federal Reserve Board ended up being made up of a lot of the people who were part of this Aldrich plan and part of the meeting of six. And their names are very important here. Um, it's very important you remember who these people are and who they're associated with. I, I think, again, I'm jumping around a bit here because of time, but uh, Rothbard talks about the Blue Ribbon participants at the Jekyll Island meeting were... Uh, Senator Nelson W. Um, Aldrich, um, yes. you know, uh, basically a Rockefeller-in-law. Yes. Uh, Henry P. <laughs> Davidson, a Morgan partner. Uh, Paul M. Warburg, part of the um, the Warburg banking family. He was influential both in America and in Germany. Um, Frank A. Vanderslip, vice president of Rockefeller's National City Bank. The, um, the Warburgs, by the way, were also the um, the Rothschilds agents in America. Mm -hmm. um, and part and part of his agents in uh, Germany as well. Uh, Charles D. Norton, president of Morgan's First National Bank of New York. Um, a. P. Andrew, Harvard economicist and staff assistant to Aldrich, uh, Aldrich, to Aldrich on the Monetary Commission. These were all insiders, and instead of being punished for doing this, they were essentially given governmental rubber stamp. Yes, like the the, the what happened was Woodrow Wilson came in and he pretended to put this into the public domain but instead all he did was essentially um make the uh, monopoly of the banks by these powerful financiers a government project the founding fathers would have probably put this lot against a wall <laughs> certainly they would yeah, have broken it up on the spot this is uh yeah 
There's a lot of names here with a lot of, um, <clears throat> this is such horrendous. This is, this is literally crony capitalism. This is the, perhaps even the beginnings of the it's, worst. It's of not, the thing is, it's crony capitalism took place under Roosevelt. Yeah. You can say that this, this isn't crony capitalism. This is state sponsored monopoly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, you're right. That's probably the better way of putting it. But, um, yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's state sponsored capitalism of financial institution, uh, taking complete control of the financial, financial institutions of the United States of America, which is rapidly at this point becoming the biggest financial player well, the, the thing is, in the world after England. Yeah, the, it, it is. And the thing is, Woodrow Wilson creates the Federal Reserve, and guess who appoints um, the 12 regional kind of. Um, d directors of the districts. Sorry, there's there's twelve districts. It's not state by state. Sorry, there's twelve regional and district federal reserve banks in the system. It, it it's it's broken up into regions. I should say, not states. That's that's a miss. That's a miss thing by me. Um, there's not there's not like fifty one of them. Um, but he basically each leader of the federal reserve banks makes it the board of the federal reserve. And Woodrow Wilson, the president, appoints the federal reserve board. Um, yeah, he spans his book governed by nine directors, uh, three of whom are chosen directly by the banks. Yep. Um, and Rothbard rightly describes them as cartelizing um, and inflationary. They, they create what is essentially a cartel that is allowed to have control not only of the money supply, but of a lot of bond issuing. The Fed isn't as all powerful as it becomes in later eras because it has to raise money and put money into the economy by the selling of bonds to third parties. That is its biggest weakness at this point. Uh, it, it isn't as all-powerful as it becomes later, but they really have been set on the path to exclusive control of the money supply. And he oh, is yeah. essentially given mo the control of the money supply to the banks. Yes. To, to the very people who benefit from, from, you know, there's no separation there like there would be, like there was with the Bank of England. The Bank of England wasn't made up of the other banks, even though they did have a say and they did have a, a seat at the table. Ultimately, the Bank of England were the, the people who decided, you know, what was done where. It, it wasn't done directly by the banks. This is, in the Federal Reserve System, is done basically directly by the banks, but under the umbrella of government authority. It is, it, it is an, almost an unconscionable system um because it it really does just place so much power in the hands of these of these industrialists of these, no, not industrialists these of these bankers very um, very few as well it is a yes. literally a tiny handful of it's uh, they're almost massively incestuous as well the you know the there's a lot of uh, a lot of people. These these are these are the same guys that would go to the meet. They would all be best friends. They were all meeting together. They, they this is a tiny little gang of best buddies essentially taking total financial control of the United States at this point. Total well, this, control. This 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 is passed in December 1913. So in his first year in office, um, Woodrow Wilson has not only passed a federal income tax and a corporation tax, he has also passed the Federal Reserve Act. He has, within 12 months, essentially just completely destroyed a lot of the principles under which the American economy was, was being run. Or is he, you know, okay, I'll be generous and he's revolutionized it, as some would say, you know. He's, he's modernized it into its current, you know, more democratic form in which the banks get to control the money supply. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, make make a note of these names because they will become very important moving forward. Most notably, the Morgan Partners and Warburg. Mm -hmm. You will see these cropping up again and again as we move into World War One because the Federal Reserve is incredibly important in the events that proceed uh, and and throughout what happens in World War One. In fact, I will make a proclamation here and say that World War One could not have happened without the Federal Reserve. <laughs> yeah, or at least not in the form that we experienced. I don't think but, in the form. That's, yeah. that's something to get onto in a the, little bit. We need to start. Yeah, there's a lot more that, or and uh, there's you know, many, many, many people had agreed to defend many other countries, etc., etc., that caused the massive conflagration of 
complete fuckery that happened in the First World War, but it wouldn't have been a world war without the Fed, you are correct. Like I said, I, I apologize for my skimming over Woodrow Wilson. I'm going to have to probably add more detail to him as we go into World War One. Um, yeah. That's probably the more appropriate place to kind of flesh out him as a character. But I needed to go into a lot of, basically, because we went into the Hegel and utilitarian stuff, the ideological underpinnings of him, at least. Because that is incredibly important that you realize that he is personifying the, these ideas that are pervasive in this age of interventionist economics, that he really is, you know, re uh, deriving legitimacy from people like Hegel and utilizing ideas put forward by the utilitarians. It, it's very important that you understand that. So, sorry, it's just uh, it's okay. not, not, to, not to get into too much of a ramble there. It's okay. We just, we've just had a, uh, a, a, it's not a super chat, a, a donation by, uh, by Glowy, one of our, our regular donators interesting that glowy should uh should 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 crop up just as we're talking about the fed uh i can't see what it is though because it is a uh it is uh, i can read that a uh, bank uh banking system we have turns the average workers prospects into a rat race every month or so away from bankruptcy saving in in the bank is pointless because of the loss in value is more than the interest in the bank accrues this ensures People um, are too busy to do anything else. Well, what, what you're describing there is uh, something we'll get into on, which is Keynesianism and Keynesian, you know, basically inflationary pressures. Yeah. Um, not to get into it too much, but what basically what Keynes says once you get to the interwar years is that people need constant inflation or they won't do anything. Basically, you have to create an economy that is a treadmill. It's it, again, we'll, we'll probably at some point take a break from from the main series and have an entire special on Keynesianism. Uh, when we can fit it in. But yeah, <laughs> what you're describing there is pure Keynesian economics. And yes, yeah. that is what happens. Um, but yes. we, we kind of need to get into a little bit of summing up here, though. We, um, we, I yes. don't know. What, do you have anything else to add on the Federal Reserve trick? Sorry. Uh, I mean, not not at this point. I, I, it is going to get... The thing is, the Fed, the Fed gets very, very bad. The Fed starts off being mm, horrendous right from the word go and mm, very, very bad straight from the word... Straight straight from the start, but it will get really, really bad. This, this turned into seizures of gold and all sorts of other nonsense later on, all through this same cartel of... Total, total control over the financial institutes. It, it no, I, I, it, it is once again another case of absolute nightmarish secret organization that is. Well, it's not even secret, but the 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 creation of it was secret. Um, yeah, to control I, I just, the whole of the yeah. United States of America. It's a, it's a it's a nightmare. But yes, let's let's we should probably move on a little. Yes, yes, I, I have. I don't know, we can, I can maybe cover a few things we've missed here quite quickly as well. Because we have a little kind of, little summing up here screen really of how we moved from what is essentially Protestant deterministic twaddle to <laughs> modern statehood. Oh, it, is, it is, it's, it is, it is, it, that's where the ideas come from. That's what essentially utilitarianism is. Yes. Like I said, <laughs> Mills, I mentioned, mentioned earlier, Mills himself said that there is no conflict between theological determinism and human free will. Even though he is saying that man is on rails and the outcome is set, within his utilitarian framework, that is not in conflict with free will. So that is, that is what I mean when I say Protestant determinist nonsense here. Um, because, it, because it is. I, I, just, it, I love it, though, because it's perfect. Protestant deterministic twaddle is a great way of summing up, yes, everything from Hegel onwards. Um, and good God, we've just been bombarded with loads and loads of, of messages. We have. You're sharing us with cash here because we're, we're rambling so much. Thank you. I, I will it. continue to ramble. But yeah, <laughs> here we see one of the core ideas of this entire project we're doing is the rigid notion within anyone who ascribes the ideas of utilitarianism, Hegelianism, leftists in general, because that's where all their ideas come from, or, or you know, eventually when you get to Marx, is the march of history. Mm, the not... wrong side of history is a, is a, is a symptom of you know, the march mm. of history thinking, yes. that phrase. We've, you know, we've not really touched on the Whig view of history in this, which is a... oh, we... almost a shame. We... The... We have. We, have, we have a link that explains it, actually. So yes. we'll, we'll, that's, one of the, that's one of the points we'll actually go through in a second. We've got one more link to go through, then we're pretty much done. Um, 
Because, good lord, it's nearly a three hour stream. But yeah, I know, I know. You, I know you'll have your own stuff to add here, but just to sum it up briefly, the, the Protestant determinism of some like a, a, a Mills or like the preceding stuff um, gets turned into secular utilitarianism um, by Bentham, even though, you know, Mills is a student of Bentham. Um, but really, these ideas exist in tandem. You end up with the Protestant determinism, and you end up with the secular uh, utilitarianism of of, um, of Bentham that is couched in religious terms to sell it to people. Um, you then end up with the Whig view of history, which is very much informed by Hegel and Hegelianism, um, and you know that then leads to the Marxist view of history, yeah, and the progressive view of history. Um, but this is really kind of the this is the lineage of ideas from from Bentham and the Panopticon to Marxism is you know you can you can show a geniality of ideas um, because a lot of them borrow from each other and I you know there's, there's the original sin really of this worldview is the Panopticon and we're going to keep going back to that because that is the logical kind of conclusion of all these ideas and all these views of history is the panopticon because it is the spirit in which it is built you can't expound utilitarian ideas and hegelian ideas without being first a religious um extremist really and a religious absolutist and someone who believes in a theocratic version of the like of history that is set on rails you can't first of all you can't not be that um, and, you know, God just gets replaced by some other all-powerful being if, if you're not you know, actually a Protestant or actually a Christian. And second of all, you must be at some point in favor of a, of a totalitarian state. If your ideas are implemented to their fullest, that's where they will always lead because that's, you know, where you can justify them leading. Anyway, sorry, that's, that's, the, that's the end of my little bit of rant there. Um, yeah, no, I, the thing is, just to, just to add, the, the Whigs... Going back to them, they were they they were remarkably nice. It was difficult to not like the Whigs because they were they they were weak, yes, as you say, and very Hegelian, etc. But they they were quite uh, as you would see an, a, a classical liberal today. You you know they they they're very nice. They wanted the best for everybody. They were probably well, very lovely people to know and talk to because there's, they were... there's a lead in there for the last kind of link we have. Yeah. Um, which is the and again another another Mises article, another Rothbard. Again, where a lot a lot of what they're utilizing here is Rothbard because it has so much to say about this era. Um, we'll we will be talking about um, uh, Burnham. We will be talking. We will be quoting Soul. We will probably be going into um, probably a little bit of like I said, Kaczynski is. We'll be going into like a whole bunch of other thinkers as well. Don't worry about that. I've got a whole reading list of references here. But it's just uh, I'm I'm just so impressed by what Rothbard has to say about all of this because he's he's so logical with it, um, and what he says about you know I don't know if you want to read this or not, Trig. Oh, which one? Which one are, which one are we looking for? Is it the uh... Uh, the Whig, the progressive theory of history? He starts there he starts go. it talking about the Whig view of history. There we go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so I was uh... Uh, I I was one ahead. Yes, the uh, the Whig theory of history as it puts here, uh, began in the early to mid-19th century and has taken over. It's still with us. It's still dominant despite its criticisms in the 1930s and 40s. Basically, what the Whig theory of history says is that history is an inevitable march upward into the light. In other words, step by step, the world always progresses, and this progress is inevitable. Now, the Whigs Again, themselves... Hegelian. Yeah, very, Sorry. very. Now, the Whigs themselves were kind of lovable. They were moderate, liberal classicals, and when they coined the theory in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, there was a certain amount of justification for it. Indeed, if they looked back into the past, seeing things seemed to be getting better and better. There was an increase in freedom, an increase in civilization, and the standard of living and science and knowledge and so on and so forth. And so, unfortunately, they made this impressionistic conclusion to, the, to a doctrine saying, this is inevitable. If this is 1870, we're better off in every way than 1860, etc. Yeah, it's, it's results-oriented thinking, yeah. is what it is. Which is... Which and, is and, yeah. it's, that's fine, that's good, but it's not something to cast in stone and then blindly carry on with. 
as as he's going to say say here, they would definitely have a very very different outlook uh, on and have to rethink what they were what they were thinking if they started. They they wouldn't have written this in say nineteen sixty or nineteen fifty. It would have been very very clear to them that there were some whopping great hiccups in the nineteenth century. Um, that that prove this this theory to be somewhat catastrophically inaccurate, and yet because this theory is cast in stone back all the way back in the eighteenth century, even though it's criticised, even though it is proved to be horrendously short sighted by the catastrophe that is the the early to mid twentieth 20th, 20th century, uh, that is clearly not getting better and better, not certainly what? for some people. Um, Brian E. asked a good question in the chat, which is, well, obviously the, the big question is progress to what? And that's where the Marxists really insert themselves into, you know, the Whig view of history. Yeah. Um, the, the article goes on to talk about the fact that, um, you know, according to Marxists, if it's inevitable, that means it's good. Yep. And they view their version of history as inevitable. But what, they, what they do is they take the Whig view of history to its... Um, logical conclusion that yeah. you know that, that they believe that step by step the linear approach upward is a is a dialectic approach. Um, but it's not a, an <laughs> upward approach, but a zigzag approach. What they say, um, they kind of twist it a bit. They they talk about the fact that uh, you know, Mark history is not a step upwards towards freedom. It's a you know it's a step by step progress towards Marxism and towards you know, the proletariat governed state was communism. They believe that history is an inexorable march to what they think is paradise. Yeah. And it, that, that's, that's, where, that's where they take it. And that's ultimately the, the failure of the Whigs, is they didn't realize that their view of history could be so easily hijacked. It's, again, it's, it's the progress is towards the end of history, towards a, a stalemate state of horrendous disgusting utopianism which will be utopianism it will be a utilitarian utopianism at best and it would be only for the bare majority um yes it's it's a case of what i want to show here is that the thinking that we reach when you when you start getting people like wilson and lloyd george who are pulling very obviously on Marxist ideas. They are. You, you can't argue that they're not doing that. Um, what they're really pulling on is this big thread of determinism, mm. this big thread that history has an end point that is inevitable, is inexorable, and we are moving step by step towards it. And they also are pulling on this idea from Hegel that they are the men who can guide us to this point. That they, through their will and the imposition of their will on the economy, and through the legitimizing um, facade of them being vessels of the people, what they are really doing is just empowering themselves towards, you know, being the kings of paradise. They, if, if, you, if you take their thinking to the logical conclusion, they're going to make utopia and they're going to be the god of it. Oh, yeah. it, it is a bleak, bleak view of these people's mindsets, in, 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 in my opinion. And they, like are, I said, they are to be the eye in the tower <clears throat> in the Panopticon. Don't, don't, yes. don't think any of us are, gonna get, uh, are going to be anything other than prisoners in that horrendous prison. Whether There's... they realize it or not, what they are doing is they are step by step building Bentham's utopia, which is the Panopticon, and they are placing themselves in the position of the warden. Yes. And placing you in the position of the prisoner. And uh, as we move forward through that, we're going to talk about that a lot, in that step by step, whether or not these people have good intentions or not doesn't actually matter, because we can go over that now. So we, last conclusion, it's, it's been three hours, guys. We're just going to get on to our last kind of examination of the events of what happened here, which is just pure power politics. We're going to look at just, who, you know, when you look at an interaction, when you look at a, a an event in history, the first thing you should ask before anything is who benefits? That That is the only analysis really you can do. Mm -hmm. Who benefits? Intentions don't matter. You know, rhetoric doesn't matter. When you strip it all down, who benefits? 
who is the people who you know who gains power who loses power who gains wealth who loses wealth mm-hmm. well I know in the UK trig what's your assessment then of this well consistently this we we've, we've been asking these questions subtly throughout this this little brief 3 hours that we've been discussing you know the 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 people's acts the the the, the people's budgets it is all actually we're going to we're going to tell you it's for you, but whilst we're going to tell you it's for you, we're going to just take a big chunk of your income. We're going. To, it, it is all about aggrandizement of a very few new class, relatively speaking, um, of parliamentarians. The parliamentarians are the only people that gain power here. The only people that lose power are the landowners and the serfs. Yes. The serfs. So it doesn't matter if you are a duke. Or a or, or or just a a peasant farmer. Both are losing power. The ones that are gaining wealth and power, the parliamentarians. Yes. Who is gaining wealth? The parliamentarians. They're taxing. They've they've given themselves the ability to reach into your pocket and take just just one penny in every pound you earn. At that point, now it's forty pennies in every pound you earn, or I will more, say- or more, because you've got taxes here, taxes on trades, mm. taxes on everything you freaking do. Yeah, this is this is why this is you could take this back to where the Romans were. This is why Julius Caesar got very, very, very annoyed with the uh, well, their version of the Parliament back in the day. The Senate was was you know crushed, and the rise of an emperor again well, I, happened. I will say it's been put in chat. Qui bono? Yeah. Also, who benefits? Who, who gains? Yeah, and who watches the Watchman is another thing to ask. Yeah, these people are setting themselves up to be the absolute avatars, the absolute we watch over everything, and there is nobody watching us. And you, oh, you get to vote on us? No problem at all. We're the parliamentarians. We're the representatives of the people. You get to vote on us, and you can either vote me in, or my freaking exact double who went to exactly the same school as me. Who we've been drinking buddies for our entire lives. And, and he's, he's, of course, got the left-wing view, I've got the right-wing view. But, you know, it, it's the same fucking person, every single party. It's all skull and bones. The, the well, same thing. Uh, what's happening here, though, is that the justification for this is that that will end. We're not there yet. We're, you know, we're, we're at 1914 now. Yeah. The justification, especially in the UK with the liberal reforms, is that um, they will become more, you know, egalitarian. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention the liberal reforms also made uh, the political, the professional politician a thing. They yeah. were the people who initiated a salary for MPs. Before that, MPs were essentially greatly interesting weirdos. Like the MP was always a, a class apart in the, in the UK when parliamentarianism came about. There were always people who were lawyers, barristers, you know, industrialists. They were people of means, but they're you know. They weren't professional politicians. They weren't the political class. And you can really see this as the, in the UK, the codifying of the political class. In that they, they become the elites now. It's not the landowners. The king is, you know, he's a constitutional monarch. He, you know, post-Victoria, the king does not have power. Um, oh, she, you know, she, the... she was the last great monarch of, of the UK. Yes, um, very much so. We've not even really mentioned King George in this, because really he was beholden to parliament. Yep. In fact, I forgot to mention it again, but the uh, the Liberal Party actually threatened him and told him, "Either you create a whole bunch of Liberal peers, or we will dis- you know we will have a constitutional crisis on our hands." Yeah, like they basically just went up to him and told him, "Magic some peers out of thin air." Um, something that Tony Blair did again. <laughs> yeah, something that Tony Blair did do again. Yes, uh, history history repeats itself. History repeats itself. Um, but yeah, in the UK, um, unless you literally believe. In the UK and the US, sorry, unless you literally believe that the president and the prime minister are spiritual level avatars of, of the c- collective human will of the populace, in a literal sense, you can only ever conclude that the people who have gained power are the politicians. They are the ones who, who gain from the increase of the size of the state, not the people. And it's what they do with that power which defines how they interact with the people. But the people who gain power are the parliamentarians in the UK, and the president 
and the institutions around the president, you know, the new institutions of office, the new inspectorates in the U.S., and who loses power are the traditional industri- uh, the, the, the new industrialists in the U.S. and the traditional landed classes in the U.K. Um, and it's the same way around with wealth as well. The government gains wealth, and the industrialists and the landed classes lose wealth. Um, in, in both cases, the, the governments in the U.S. and the U.K. gain wealth and power massively. And the traditional elites uh, of the landed classes, you know, the, 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 uh, the rich non-political men, essentially, are the ones who lose power. And it really becomes a, a, a situation in which um, material wealth starts to come secondary to political power. And again, I want to talk about as we move forward with this. That the final point I will make is that it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter if you are Rockefeller, because J.P. Morgan will pay Theodore Roosevelt, and he'll smash your company to pieces. It, it essentially what this demonstrates neatly is that the idea that you know communists and socialists have it backwards. The pol- you know, the parliamentarians and the political elite in the U.S. Um, are not beholden to private industry. Private industry, really, after this point, is beholden to them. Yeah, they have established institutions, which mean they, at any point, can smash any company they decide is a trust in the U.S. And in the U.K., the the, the MPs at any point can force through legislation that makes their agenda you know, come true in any session of parliament because they don't have the lords there to tell them no. And they essentially can, you know, beat with a stick the traditional landed class of the UK to the amusement of the masses, you know, from the perspective of the, of the landed classes anyway. So that, that is the situation you really find yourself in, that, that there, there are people that, that private industry now and property rights especially are already beholden to a great extent to the whims of the state. Yep. Gone. In fact. Totally beholden. At, 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 at the whim of the states as to whether they exist or not. Gone. And the justification for all of this is democracy. It is, we are the people's budget. I am the people's president. Therefore, my expansion of power is legitimate. It is not self-interested. It is, in fact, altruistic. And you begin to see the mind games that democracy plays when it comes to power. It is, it is the creation of unbelievable amounts of power, is what's happened. They have given themselves and created for themselves so much power that no institution... Unlimited power. Um... Lit- literally, though. Literally, it is a, a, absolutely... The government can snap its fingers now and someone's disappeared black bagged no one dare say anything they'll find uh, this th- was, they'll uh, find out what to, what to do and how to a footnote it. here is that also this is the period in which the fbi is established as well yes um but that is a that that will really come to fruition in the 1920s again there's a lot we can't cover here um and what well, what i'll leave you with is is this thought is that Essentially, what happened here is that they have increased power in the hands of one man greater than it was in the Age of Kings. Because in the Age of Kings, they did not have the technological means to enforce that power directly that they have when it gets to 1914. Yeah. They do, the, the world is smaller, the gains are bigger, the industry is more concentrated, and the people are more numerous. And that means that they hold more power than any human beings in human history before them. And it, it also means that they, they do not derive their power from God like a traditional English king did from the Middle, you know, from the middle Ages onwards. The, yep. the essential derivation of power, or at least in theory, if you believe in that, was that they were you know, divine instruments, you know, that they, it would be heretical to say that they were, you know, aspects of God, but they were chosen by God. And that's where their power is derived from. But in that calculation, you have to be beholden to the Christian traditions, 
and you have to be beholden to the church and, and all of that within it. And if, if the people see you not being pious, they will destroy you. But in the secular age of the state as God, these men do not have any limiting factor on their power. No, it's, they, it... they, they de facto become god kings yeah. in, in that sense. I was, it's, I was going to say, it is worse. They are chosen by the state, but they get to choose who, who, which few get to be chosen by the state. And when they are chosen by the state through some weird democratic process, whichever one you choose, they then become the god itself they are god emperors as you say they they are they are the god of that state if only for a short period of time not that that makes any difference because they are all right all friends of each other we're gonna have to round it out now um, on, because then. we have been streaming for about three and a quarter hours i Oop. just want to read off these last donations we've got because you guys cool. got a bunch about 25 minutes ago um, we have a $3 donation here from Glowy that says, um, oh yeah, sorry, I already read that one. Um, that's the one about the rat race. I'm oh, sorry. Um, we've got He Who Wipes, which is quite a good name. <laughs> so you, you mustn't be Indian then. Um, $20 says, thank you guys for what you're doing, these streams, uh, and for explaining to everyone how cartoonishly evil people like Woodrow and Wilson were. Have a few Twixes from me. Thank you very much. Uh, although you use Twix as the plural. I quite like that, actually. Twix is the plural of Twix. Because it is, it's two. Anyway, yeah. um, we need another Andrew Jackson to rise from the grave and end Federal Reserve Bank. I mean, he'd, he'd probably just he'd probably just challenge the entirety of the Federal Reserve Board to a duel. I'll be a second. Um, <laughs> I'll stand behind that man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, Camden, I can't read that one. Canadian Heston, I think that is. Uh, says, now I can see why Marx loves central banking. Oh boy, if you think Marx loves central banking, wait till you get to um, wait till you get to the actual Russian Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> they really love central banking for uh, for very specific reasons. And another $5 donation here from Glowy saying, uh, article on Star Trek website gives approval of communism saying uh, that is what Star Trek future is. Still haven't addressed how uh, Scarcity is real, you know, is a real reason in law that resulted in Star Trek Universe on moving past money. Yeah, they, they don't do the whole, they kind of hand wave away the whole post scarcity thing. Yes. I, I quite like stuff like DS9, which kind of laughs at the whole space communism stuff, which is hilarious because all of its writers are now incredibly ultra leftist and don't seem to, uh, to acknowledge that aspect of the show. And Wind Talker has just donated another $5 to the Super Chat, just saying, ooh, ooh. But Thank you guys for listening through this absolute, what has become an epic of a stream. I think we've covered all the high points, apart from a couple of Woodrow Wilson points. I will, I will cover them during the First World War, don't you worry. Uh, Woodrow Wilson will have a thorough biography at some point in, in, this, in this series. I just, we just needed to get past and talk about the essential stuff of the Federal Reserve, because that really is in this period, along with income tax, what he did. So, thank you guys for listening. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for whipping us for three and a quarter hours. Thank you, Trig, for putting up with me as this project has ballooned in scope and research. <laughs> I keep saying, don't apologize, dude. I'm loving this. I really am. This is this is this is great. In in many respects, it was saving us. I was working, and Canadian Heston has just donated another five dollars. What is it? Oh, I can't. I didn't read that. I can't read that. You have the uh, the Streamlab stuff open. Uh... I do. Yes. yes. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, it's been great, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, the huge amount of reading that I've still got to do. I I need to do more reading on Woodrow Wilson. Okay, was... yeah, he said also you were wrong about tanks in Afghanistan. Yes, we, I technically we were, but they limited their use for PR reasons. They did. Yeah. They, 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 they. I said they didn't use them. That was wrong. They did use them, but they limited their use. Yeah. Anyway, guys, um, thank you for watching. I'm gonna go lie down. <laughs> I'm gonna go play <laughs> down now. Uh, cool. uh, but yeah, no, no. But before I do, again, um, usual shilling. Discord is in the description. You can follow me on Mines. You can follow Trig on Twitter on Mines. Yep. Um, I still do seal of approval. That uh, we still have Dumper with Scrumps coming out. Um, there was one came out a couple of weeks ago. So those of you who thought you know that wasn't happening, it is happening. And we will be back next week with the second part of this five-part series, guys. There's gonna be four more of these. That is what um like another 12 hours worth of content so including this we'll have like 
over 15 hours worth to listen to so holy shit guys uh, i guarantee there's going to be more than that i know there's, there's going to be we're going to end up doing a spin-off and an explanation one and a, and a this there's going to be three or four more i guarantee it by the end of it we'll have we'll have we'll have gone we need to we need to fill out this bit we need to do this we need to do a special on this i know it's gonna it's coming you you you, you. well the main <laughs> series then is gonna be I'm, I'm gonna have to limit it to five parts the main series but yeah, <laughs> this will be happening every week until like i drop out of exhaustion or something um <laughs> but, but again thank you guys thank you for being extremely generous you guys have donated a huge amount by super chat and and direct donations yeah it must be about 70 quid you Whoa. guys have donated, so that's that's pretty. Yeah, thank you massively, uh, and we yeah, will see you. you next week. See you later. Take care.